Abraham Lincoln in Our Own County, a thesis, by Henry M. Beardsley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Abraham Lincoln in Our Own County. We visit scenes of historic interest because we seem to feel that the presence of the heroes, whose fame they help to keep, is there. Our fair West is yet new, and, save the legends of Indian battles and of the mound-builders before them, has little of history. But from our state, young as it is, great true men have gone forth and one who stands above them all, is best known and best honored of them all, was once here in our midst. The plain streets and surroundings have for us an additional interest, since we know that Abraham Lincoln has been here. There are men among us now who have known him and greeted him as honest old Abe Lincoln, the rail splitter. It was nearly forty years ago that he first came to attend court here. He was oft-times advised to go to Chicago and build up for himself a profitable business, which he was abundantly able to do. Inducements were offered him, but he preferred to ride around the circuit with a crowd of friendly lawyers, telling stories and studying in his odd moments. Of his power in the former direction we all know. McCarthy, in his History of Our Own Times, in describing Palmerston's power for storytelling, compares him with Bismarck in his early days, and with our own Lincoln. Well as Lincoln loved his fun, he was a diligent student. When a boy, he had possessed but few opportunities for getting an education, so that what little he had was picked up at odd moments. He used to carry with him, on the circuit, textbooks, such as are used in school. At one time when here, he had a geometry over which he used to pore like an ambitious schoolboy. At another time, he had a copy of Euclid. The last time he was here, not long before he was elected to the presidency, he was studying German. He had a little book such as in popular phrases known as an easy method. The German sentence was written upon one line, and upon the line below it was the translation in English. As honest in this work as in everything else, he had prepared a little card with a hole through the center, just wide enough and long enough to allow one line to be seen at a time. He would lay the card upon his book so that he could see the German sentence. Then, after puzzling over it, until he thought he had mastered it, he would slip down the card, and if his translation had been correct, would slap himself upon the knee, evidently well pleased with his work. Under such difficulties as these, the great man drilled his mind. It was a rich heart back of all that made the simple treasures of his mind gleam as they did. Judge Cunningham was hanging upon the walls at his home, a picture of Lincoln which shows him as he was known among us. His face was clean-shaven, and his dark brown hair thrown carelessly back from his high forehead. The upper part of his face was handsome and there was a sort of wistful look about the eyes that would, even in the picture, hold one's attention. The leathery skin was folded upon his face. About the mouth there was a firmness that gave additional meaning to every feature. Looking upon the face, you would feel yourself drawn to it by a sort of mysterious attraction. His dress showed negligence, yet was always clean. He scarcely ever carried with him but one suit of clothing, and hence the following incident. During the years of his practice here, there was in Urbana a short, stout Jew by the name of Alshuler, who kept a daguerreotype gallery. 
As Lincoln was becoming somewhat famous, the Jew pressed to come up to the gallery and sit for a picture. Finally, rather pleased himself at the idea, the statesman stepped in one day, when he had gained a little leisure from his work, attired in a long linen coat. Now a linen coat is the worst sort of an affair to have on when one sits for a picture, and so the Jew objected strongly. But, said Mr. Lincoln, this is all the coat I have brought with me from home. Ha, ha, I have it, I have it, said the artist, after a moment's pause. You shall wear my coat. Readily assenting to the proposition, Mr. Lincoln removed his own coat and put on that of the Jew. It was scarcely an improvement, for the garment of the Jew was, by far, too short, while the sleeves came little beyond his elbows. But this difficulty was soon easily remedied. At the artist's desire, Mr. Lincoln seated himself in a chair, and after carefully adjusting the coat, put his hands behind him and thus sat for his picture. From Lincoln's first appearance here until 1859, there appeared upon the court records the names of but few lawyers now practicing in our midst. There were others, like Mr. Lincoln, who traveled around the circuit. Prominent among these were Mr. Sweat, now of Chicago, Mr. Lamon, David Davis, afterwards judge of the circuit, and O. B. Ficklin, member of Congress from the district south of us. These were a jovial set of men who knew well how to appreciate Lincoln's stories. The old hotel in Urbana stood across the street from where the St. Nicholas now stands, and during the noon hour, and oft times until in the night time, passers-by could hear the roars of laughter provoked by these stories. Judge Davis used to delight in these as heartily as the best. Coming here from some other court in the circuit on the first evening, so soon as the crowd of lawyers had gathered together at the hotel, Davis would say, "'Now, Lincoln, let us have that story.' And the story, once begun, the evening was filled with merriment. There are some who remember Lincoln as he appeared in court. He was very tall, six feet four, and very awkward. He used to sit with one of his long legs hanging over the other, the toe of the shoe on one locked behind the heel of the other. When he arose to speak, he seemed much embarrassed, and as is normally the case, knew not what to do with his hands so he had a habit of clasping them very awkwardly over his stomach. As he warmed up, however, he soon forgot his hands, and being freed they aided him in his delivery. While standing, likely as not, he had one of his long legs slung over the back of a chair, or had his foot placed upon it. Some lawyers would address the jury in fine oratorical language, he never made a pretense at eloquence. He used to stand before the jury and talk as one of their number. He was the thirteenth man of the jury, telling his opinion of the case. Such homely phrases as, I reckon, made his language familiar. Beginning his argument, he would state that of his opponent fairly and squarely would state the case so that it would seem he had granted his side all away. Then he would turn, and with his ever-recurring, but, would bring forth his reasons fast and with force. His style of argument was strong and clear. He built his position, as it were, a series of steps. Each point was connected with the one before and after it. Great as was his love of telling stories, he never used them in his speeches at all. Beside the influence of his manner, he won upon a jury by his reputation. Everyone believed him honest, 
and the jurymen would sit and look up into his face, drinking every word he uttered for the truth. Henry Clay, infamous for the number of murderers whom he saved from a merited doom. I only know of one case where Lincoln argued eloquently against his conscience, and then he was pleading for the sin of one who had been his friend and benefactor. He may even then have been honest in his plea, believing the boy innocent. In the fall of fifty-eight, two men in a grocery store at Sidoris, engaged in a discussion upon politics, became angry, and one, snatching from the counter by his side a four-pound weight, threw at the other and killed him. Ward H. Lamon was at the time prosecuting attorney. The widow of the murdered man engaged O. B. Ficklin to aid in the prosecution. Messrs. Lincoln and Sweat were the lawyers for the defense. When the time came for the presentation of the argument, Mr. Lincoln, in his turn, made his speech. As the trial had proceeded, he had become more and more persuaded that his client deserved severe punishment. His speech was a failure. Judge Davis told him so afterwards, and he acknowledged it. Sweat, however, took his turn with a fine argument, and the murderer was let off with a few years in the penitentiary. At another time, I am told, having become convinced that he was on the wrong side of the case, he was missing when called for to make his argument. The messenger sent to search for him found him in his room. "'Tell the judge,' he said, that I am busy and can't come. His humor oft-times served him in a trial. I find in the Urbana Union for March 4, 1858, a story of his own to the point. A crowd of men were in an office discussing the fight in Congress upon the Lecompton Constitution, when Lincoln entered and was asked his opinion on the matter. Having seated himself in a chair, and having thrown one leg over the other in his usual way, he said he could best illustrate his opinion by means of a story. There were two men, he said, in a neighboring county who had often met at loggerheads. One day, after an earnest discussion at their border line, one of them, in his anger, leaped over the fence and gave the other a sound thrashing. I was engaged for the defense. The witness for the prosecution was a very talkative fellow, not confining himself to the mere matter of the questions put, but willing to tell all he knew. When it came my turn to question him, I asked, You say you saw the fight? Yes, stranger, I reckon I did. Was it much of a fight? I'll be darned if it wasn't, stranger, a right smart fight. How much ground did the contestants cover over? About one acre. About one acre, I repeated musingly. Well, now, witness, tell me, wasn't that just about the smallest crop of a fight off of an acre of ground that you have ever heard of? That's so, stranger. I'll be gall darned if it wasn't. The jury, said Mr. Lincoln, giving his leg a twitch and waiting for the roar of laughter to subside, find my client just ten cents. At another time, Oliver Davis, now judge at Danville, was opposed to him in a case. Davis, in reviewing his opponent's argument, repeated again and again, Mr. Lincoln holds this position. Mr. Lincoln holds that position. Finally, Lincoln looked up from where he sat and asked, with a twinkle in his eye, That was a curious position, wasn't it? Coming from anyone else, so little a thing had not been noticed. But as it was, 
the question destroyed a great deal of the power of Mr. Davis's argument. Mr. Lincoln never cared to accumulate wealth. His charges were always reasonable. There was once in our midst a worthy carpenter by the name of Campbell, who had taken a horse in part pay for some work he had done. The horse proved to be unsound, and Campbell sued the man from whom he had obtained it. Lincoln took the case for him, and worked hard all of one day trying it. "'I was standing by,' says one, when Mr. Campbell asked what the fee was. Five dollars will do, I guess,' said Lincoln. At one time Lincoln had a case for the Illinois Central Railroad Company, and won it. He made his fee one thousand dollars, which the company refused to pay. He sued the company for the money, and during the trial of the case several lawyers called upon to testify to the value of the service rendered placed it at five thousand dollars. There was a man for some time residing in Urbana who used often to speak of Lincoln's kindness to him. It seems that the man had become involved in a lawsuit upon the result of which much depended. He went to several lawyers who refused to take his case because they doubted his ability to pay. He came to Lincoln and laid the matter before him, showed him that if he lost the case he was a ruined man. Lincoln undertook the case for him and won it. One day the man met Lincoln on the street and stopped him to thank him for his services, said he could not pay him then, and did not know how soon he would be able. "'That's all right, my friend, that's all right,' said Lincoln, as he grasped the man by the hand. "'And would you believe it?' the client would add, with tears in his eyes, as he told the incident. "'He left five dollars in my hand.' When engaged in an important case, Lincoln was all absorbed in his work. He would walk along the street lost in thought, and would not even notice his best friends. "'I have seen him,' says one, walk back and forth in the courtyard, regardless of everything around him. He was a very careful lawyer. Long as he had practiced, he would never write the simplest forms without his book before him. He was very kind to young men just beginning their study. One time, when others were laughing at one who was much embarrassed in making out some forms new to him, Lincoln arose, and speaking kindly to him, showed him what he needed to know. He even spoke encouragingly to those who were just beginning their practice. Lincoln made several speeches in our county. In the fall of 1856, he spoke from the courthouse in Urbana upon the constitutionality of the action of Congress with regard to slavery in the territory. The county paper of the time speaks highly of the effort of its power and logic, and of the speaker's ability. At one time he spoke in what is known as the Goose Pond Church, a little building near the Doan House. During his speech he had occasion to read from some paper which he had in his possession. His eyesight was beginning to fail him and it was with great difficulties that he could see to read. He held the paper off at arm's length, and then drew it to him, moving it back and forth. Finally someone back in the crowd yelled out, "'Put on your specs!' "'Ah!' said Lincoln, reaching out his long bony arm far as he could. "'My eyes are all right, but my arm is too short.' The most important speech that Mr. Lincoln ever made here was upon September 24, 1858, in the old fairground. Douglas was here and spoke upon the 23rd. Lincoln's speech was made in reply to the one he gave. Mr. Lincoln arrived, 
and was received at the Doan House platform on the afternoon of the 23rd. It was in regard to the occasion that a characteristic letter was written to Mr. Cunningham, who had invited Mr. Lincoln to speak here. The letter was written from Ottawa. I crossed swords, it read, here today with Douglas for the first time. The fire flew some, but I am happy to say that I am still alive. In the evening after his arrival, Lincoln was the guest of the Champaign, then West Urbana, Republican Club. The night was passed at Mr. Baddeley's, the large brick building across the street from the Episcopal Church. Until a late hour, the house and yard were filled with citizens. Speeches were made, and music had in abundance. On the 24th, at 10 o'clock, the procession formed at the park to march to Urbana. It was the finest procession Champagne had ever witnessed. The deep interest taken in the occasion is made more apparent when we remember that the time of the year was the worst possible for the getting together of a crowd, that the county fair had just closed having filled three days with excitement, that there was scarcely a family in the county in which there was not some sickness, and that Douglas had drained the county the day before. The crowd was immense. The procession led by the Urbana Brass Band, German Band, and Danville Band, over sixty young ladies on horseback with their attendants, thirty-two of whom represented the States of the Union, was over two miles in length. All proceeded to the old fair ground, where a basket picnic was held. "'Have the dinner first, said Lincoln to the officer of the day. "'Folks will listen to me better for it.' The table at which Lincoln sat was well loaded, and the best of the luxuries were placed around his plate. He, however, chose out a turkey leg and biscuit, and began to make his meal upon these. Looking around, he saw behind him an old lady known as Granny Hutchison, standing, looking longingly at the feast. "'Here, Granny,' said Lincoln, springing from his seat. "'You have my place.' And the kind-hearted orator sat back upon the root of a tree and finished his turkey leg and biscuit, while Granny enjoyed a bountiful dinner. Thus the man's kindness of heart showed itself everywhere. In his speech he began by asking if Douglas had made his point on that, and having found what arguments the senator had used, he proceeded to answer them in his clear, logical manner. Douglas used oft-times to abuse Lincoln's character, accusing him of having kept a saloon. To such personalities as this, Lincoln seldom deigned to reply. It was in one of his speeches made here that he said, "'Douglas has accused me of having kept a saloon, but I have never before mentioned that during that time he was my best customer. While I served on one side of the counter, he served on the other.'" On September 6, 1858, Lincoln spoke at Montville. One writing from that place says, About ten o'clock, hearing that the delegation from the Champaign County was approaching town, a company of thirty-two young men on horseback, with flags in their hands under the best of martial regulations, galloped out to meet the Champaignese, whom they found in strong numbers, making a procession nearly a mile long, headed by two bands of music. Our people took a great interest in Lincoln's political career. It was at Bloomington that a resolution was passed, previous to the senatorial conflict, that we want a big man with a big heart and a big intellect to represent this our big state. At our own county convention in June 58, the following resolution was adopted that the Honorable Abraham Lincoln is our first, last, and only choice 
to fill the vacancy to occur in the U.S. Senate on the 4th of March next, that we are jealous of his honor and rights, and that we repudiate all influence, whether coming from home or abroad, to thwart us in this cherished and unalienable purpose of the Republican Party of this state. Then the thought came that Abraham Lincoln might be our president. We had the pleasure, says the editor of the Central Illinois Gazette, published at the time in Champaign, of introducing to the hospitalities of our sanctum a few days since the Honorable Abraham Lincoln. Few men can make an hour pass away more agreeably. We do not pretend to know whether Mr. Lincoln will ever condescend to occupy the White House or not, but if he should, it is a comfort to know that he has established for himself a character and reputation of sufficient strength and purity to withstand the disreputable influences of even that locality. Speaking of Lincoln's honesty, the same editor relates an anecdote. It was in Springfield, during the session of a Douglas Democratic convention. Any man used to wire-pulling would have been on hand with his schemes. Lincoln was seen standing in a direction opposite from the convention, and when asked where he was going, replied that it was to attend the funeral of an old neighbor. A point worthy of notice in Lincoln's character is his temperance. While it was the custom of the lawyers of his association to drink, he never drank with them. Once in a while he would play a game of billiards. I remember, an old citizen tells me, the first game I ever played with him. When it came my turn to play, he said to me in a very legal-like manner, Now, if this were my case, I would hit this ball, make it roll against that one, have it hit the cushion, and then roll back against the third ball there. The last words of Mr. Lincoln in our county were uttered February 11, 1861, at Tolono. He had been elected President of the United States, and was on his way to Washington. Secession in the South had already begun its work, and all eyes were turned towards the coming President. In passing through Tolono, in response to applause which hailed his appearance upon the car platform, he said, I am leaving you on an errand of national importance, attended, as you are aware, with considerable difficulties. Let us believe, as some poet has expressed it, behind the cloud the sun is still shining. I bid you an affectionate farewell. The train moved on and vanished in the east, and when next it returned it bore the form of Abraham Lincoln, cold and still, wrapped in black, while his soul had pierced the cloud and entered into the sunlight beyond. Abraham Lincoln was not a man of great intellect, but of rich heart powers. In the dark hour of our nation's need he came found his place, and filled it. Melancholy dropped from him as he walked, yet all who knew him loved him. There are old gray-headed men and women in our midst who speak his name with affection, for have they not known him, heard his voice, felt the grasp of his hand, and comprehended his great warm heart? Such a man has lived and moved among us. The End End of Abraham Lincoln in Our Own County A Thesis by Henry M. Beardsley Recording by Roger Moline The American Tent Caterpillar by J. M. Swain From an Entomological Circular, Department of Agriculture, Dominion of Canada in 1918. From time to time, outbreaks of the tent caterpillars occur in different parts of Canada. Not infrequently, these outbreaks attain serious proportions 
owing to the absence of natural or artificial means of control and the caterpillars are then severely destructive to orchards shade trees and hardwood forests a few years ago severe outbreaks of tent caterpillars occurred in the provinces of new brunswick quebec ontario and british columbia and serious defoliation of forest and orchard resulted in localities where these outbreaks have occurred unless the natural enemies such as parasitic insects and disease are sufficient to control the pests a recurrence of their depredations may usually be expected the nature of the injury the caterpillars appear in spring and feed upon the leaves of broad-leafed trees of many species the american tent caterpillar Malacosoma americana is most common on fruit trees wild cherry and hawthorn but when very abundant it readily attacks a variety of shade and forest trees its conspicuous tents constructed during april and may are familiar to everyone the forest tent caterpillar Malacosoma distria prefers poplar birch elm oak maple and other forest trees but it is also found in orchards particularly in years of great abundance during the season of 1912 these two species but particularly the forest tent caterpillar stripped many thousands of trees in infested districts of quebec ontario and new brunswick square miles of poplar and birch were completely defoliated by the hordes of caterpillars after the foliage of an area is destroyed the caterpillars sometimes march in great armies in search of new food defoliating the trees and shrubs along their route it was not uncommon in the summer of 1912 for the trains on the gatineau river line of the canadian pacific railway in quebec to be stopped by myriads of these caterpillars swarming on the rails which were effectively greased by their crushed bodies the engine men were kept busy in many places sanding the rails and sweeping away the crawling masses of caterpillars in front of the engine while the latter was often covered with hundreds of the creatures after passing through the infested districts similar instances of the stoppage of trains by the caterpillars have been reported from new brunswick and british columbia by the end of the first week in june large areas of poplar and birch notably in the gatineau valley and in the eastern townships of quebec were stripped as bare of foliage as though it were midwinter toward the middle of july the moths collected in myriads about the arc lights of the city of ottawa and the females deposited immense numbers of egg masses on the twigs of the city shade trees and upon objects of all kinds outbreaks of these caterpillars have been common in eastern canada and the united states from the earliest times both are native species the tent caterpillar now injurious in our apple orchards probably had as its original food tree the wild cherry which it apparently still prefers outbreaks were recorded from massachusetts as early possibly as 1646 and at recurring intervals and in varying localities these species have appeared throughout eastern america as destructive pests to orchards shade trees and forests the american tent caterpillar Malacosoma americana fabricius this is the tent building species so common in orchards during may and june it should not be confused with the fall webworm which constructs larger tents during the latter part of the season the adult is a medium-sized moth with a wing expanse of one and one-half inches or less reddish brown in color with two oblique white bands across each forewing near the middle the male is distinctly smaller than the female and has densely feathered antennae or feelers the caterpillar when full grown is about two inches in length it is black 
sparsely clothed with yellowish hairs and has a whitish band bordered with reddish brown lines along the middle of the back there is a row of blue spots along each side with reddish brown and yellow lines and markings on the sides below the egg mass the eggs are usually deposited in thick ring-like masses about the twigs each grayish black mass contains from 150 to 350 eggs firmly embedded in and completely covered by a glue-like liquid which hardens and holds the eggs safely in position until they hatch in the following april and often for long afterwards the ends of the egg masses are usually noticeably more sloping than those of the forest tent caterpillar life history and habits the egg masses of this species are found near the tips of the twigs during the winter the young caterpillars hatch from the eggs during the first warm spring days just as the apple buds are opening in fact often before any leaves have appeared they feed first upon the varnish like covering of the egg masses if the buds have not opened and soon attack the opening buds or young leaves the caterpillars from each egg mass begin at once the construction of a silken tent in a nearby crotch during fine weather they feed at intervals upon the neighboring foliage and take shelter within the tent when not feeding and particularly during cold or stormy weather layer after layer of silk spun in threads through the mouths of the caterpillars is added to the tent so that it usually presents a neat appearance and increases in size to accommodate the fast growing caterpillars on a single medium-sized wild cherry tree at chelsea quebec thirty-seven of these tents were counted each of these tents will shelter from about one hundred to two hundred and fifty caterpillars the caterpillars feed for about six weeks and become mature during the last two weeks of june or earlier according to the season and locality they then wander restlessly about seeking a suitable shelter for pupating they come to rest finally in some crevice under loose bark in a folded leaf in an angle of a fence or building or even among the silk of the tent or on the side of a house each caterpillar spins about itself a tough sack or cocoon of white silk and attaches it firmly to the object upon which it rests by a mass of more loosely spun silken strands a fluid ejected by the caterpillar upon the cocoon dries and produces a characteristic yellow powder which is dislodged readily when the cocoons are disturbed within the cocoon the caterpillar enters upon a resting or pupal stage the outer skin dries and splits and a brownish apparently legless and wingless pupa emerges therefrom it lies almost motionless within the cocoon while the organs of the adult moth are developing within its hard outer skin the cocoons are spun mostly during the last two weeks of june and the pupal stage lasts from ten days to two weeks when the moth has fully developed within the skin of the pupa the pupal skin splits and allows it to emerge at one end of the cocoon the fibers of silk are so arranged that the moth can work its way through without injury and it thus escapes in perfect condition the males and females fly during the evening and after mating the latter proceed to deposit their eggs the young caterpillars are fully formed within the eggs before the end of the season but remain there until hatching time in the following spring End of the American Tent Caterpillar by J. M. Swain from an Entomological Circular by the Department of Agriculture, Dominion of Canada, published in 1918. Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Berlin's Wonderful Horse by the New York Times this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Berlin's Wonderful Horse He can do almost everything but talk. How he was taught. Special Correspondence, The New York Times, Berlin, August 23, 1904 in an out-of-the-way part of the German capital, a horse is now shown which has stirred up the scientific, military, and sporting world of the fatherland. It should be said at the very outset that the facts in this article are not drawn from the imagination, but are based upon true observations and can be verified by Dr. Stutt, Prussian Minister of Education, by the famous zoologist Professor Möbius, director of the Prussian Natural History Museum, and by other eminent scientific and military authorities. I had occasion today to see a performance of the animal which was given in the presence of the young duke of saxe coburg gotha Hans, the wonderful stallion, is nine years old and is the property of a Herr von Osten, a retired schoolteacher. The horse has never been used for riding or driving. For over four years, Herr von Osten has given the animal systematic instruction such as he would give to a child. The industrious pedagogue is the owner of a tenement house in the northern part of Berlin, and there he lives. The animal is quartered in a small shed adjoining a court where he is shown. Some years ago, the neighborhood was astonished by observing the training which Herr von Osten gave his animal. They beheld him and Hans at a certain hour of the day, standing in the court before a blackboard and counting machine. Herr von Osten, undismayed by ridicule, for by his method he had gained the reputation of being an old crank, instructed the stallion by showing him the balls on the machine, and influencing him to indicate a number by stamping down his right hoof. At the same time, while the horse was doing this, his instructor spoke the name of the number. Then, every time Hans put down his foot correctly, he would be rewarded by a carrot or a piece of sugar. All other things the intelligent animal learned by seeing certain objects and, at the same time, hearing their names. In this way, words to him became signs for visible objects, and he used footsteps as signs for his perceptions, according to the same psychic laws as we use a language to make others understand. After Herr von Osten had taught Hans this simple sign language, the foundation for further education was established. He put before him gold, silver, and copper coins, and taught him to indicate gold pieces by one movement of the foot, silver with two, and copper with three steps. When, for example, three coins were placed in a row, Hans stepped down his foot three times when asked the number. He is also able to distinguish coins according to signs. When asked to give the value of a one-mark piece touched by his teacher, he moves his foot once, for a two-mark piece twice, etc. Hans is an expert in numbers, even being able to figure fractions. He answers correctly the number of fours in eight, in sixteen, in thirty, etc. When asked how many threes there are in seven, he stamps down his foot twice, and for the fraction once. Then, when five and nine are written under each other under the blackboard, and he is asked to add the sum, he answers correctly. Hans is also capable of distinguishing persons. He told the number of girls and officers standing in a line. A remarkable thing happened yesterday. An officer was pointed out and Hans was told, This is Count Dona. Half an hour later the same man was pointed out to him, and when asked for his name the horse picked out the letters D.O. from the blackboard. Herr von Osten, however, having the name of Dönhoff in mind, wanted to help the animal by uttering Do. Uninfluenced, however, Hans spelt out correctly Dona. In the same manner today, Hans was introduced to the Prince of saxe coburg gotha and also gave his name correctly. The versatility of Hans in other directions is astonishing. He can distinguish between straw and felt hats, between canes and umbrellas. 
he knows the different colors. One beholds several colored rags fastened on a string. A cavalry officer places himself before the horse, and Hans is asked to state the color of his cap. The horse answers by stamping his foot down three times, the color of the third rag, which, like the cap, is red. Hans has also been taught to distinguish tones. The various tones of the musical scale are numbered, and he recognizes their position by his usual method. Hans can tell the time on a watch and can indicate the exact hour. At the test yesterday he recognized persons from photographs. Herr von Osten placed persons in a row who had given him their photographs, then put the picture before the horse and asked him to indicate the position of the person in the line. Again Hans recognized the gentleman in civilian clothes who the day before had been introduced to him in uniform. He knows the name of the months and indicates the day of the week by putting down his foot, Sunday once, Monday twice, etc. Professor Möbius, the eminent zoologist, has this to say about Hans. He possesses the ability to see sharply, to distinguish mental impressions from each other, to retain them in his memory, and to utter them by his hoof language. Of course, not by himself has he learned all this, but by methodical instruction of a human intelligence who has developed the highly intelligent senses of the species horse. For wild horses, not trained in the same manner, utilize their physical and psychic faculties as does Hans to satisfy their desire for food. Herr von Osten has succeeded in training Hans by cultivating in him a desire for delicacies. This desire is aroused by questions and finger signs, according to which the stallion acts in order to satisfy his aroused desire, for as soon as he puts his foot down he snaps for the delicacy in the hand of his master. I doubt whether the horse really takes pleasure in his studies. He follows entirely mental impressions which he receives from the surroundings and which satisfy his wants. Hans is the second horse Herr von Osten has trained. He claims that any horse of fair intelligence can be so taught. Herr von Osten's training is done purely from a scientific standpoint, and he told me that he greatly regretted the premature publicity given to his work. By the time this article is in print, the Kaiser, who has heard with interest of this horse prodigy, will have seen the animal. Edward T. Hine End of Berlin's Wonderful Horse from the New York Times of September 4, 1904 Read by Avaii Conrad Aiken, Metaphysical Poet by John Gould Fletcher This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Conrad Aiken, Metaphysical Poet by John Gould Fletcher The world is seriously in need of a new classification of poets. Hitherto we have been largely content with the old labels of romantic and realist. But these old labels can no longer satisfy, for the boundaries of poetry have been enlarged since the early nineteenth century to embrace the whole field of scientific speculation which is our legacy from the evolutionists, the anthropologists, the psychologists, the sociologists, and the men of science generally. As we are today, it is evident that there may be quite as much romantic magic in a poet writing from a mind stocked with purely scientific theory as there is in Shelley, and as much realism in the narrower sense in a poet of pure romantic tendency as there is, say, in Masefield. We must seek finer distinctions. What is needed is not a new definition of the incomprehensible mystery called poetry, but a new classification of the poets themselves. When we come to examine English poetry, we can, if we observe closely, easily distinguish two main streams of inspiration in it, now parting, now fusing, 
sometimes clouded and again distinct there have been the poets who wrote largely of the aspects of things outside themselves and the poets who turning within themselves wrote of the world as mirrored in the human brain we may call the first objective and the second subjective or we may adopt a more recent nomenclature and label the first imagistic and the second symbolistic but if the spirit of inquiry is strong within us neither of these labels can completely satisfy our intelligence they do not completely cover the ground we are perhaps safer if we say that the first group of poets are externalistic and the second metaphysical in tendency there have been far more poets of the externalist type in english than of the metaphysical and these poets have been more widely read and appreciated by their contemporaries indeed by posterity than their neglected antitypes this is partly due to the mental inertia of most of us an inertia that seeks to be soothed with pretty easily explainable pictures and familiar tunes partly also to the extreme difficulty of writing good metaphysical verse the good metaphysical poet must be always turning the world inside out so to speak and since the faculty of verse writing is based primarily on an immediate emotional response to sensuous impression it is apparent that the good metaphysical poet must be always battling against his own immediate apprehensions this will explain the rarity of great metaphysical poets in england there have been so far as i remember don facile Francais in this field also vaughan and possibly marvel shakespeare and hamlet and iago webster in bosla and ferdinand gave us complete figures illuminated by the same searching metaphysic shelley had he developed in the direction of the sensi and of the triumph of time might have become one of the great metaphysical poets to turn from these figures to a writer of the present day and generation may seem to some an impertinence but we are not able to estimate the weight and significance of a writer such as conrad aiken either as poet or as critic of poetry except by making some such transition on the jacket of mr aiken's latest book his fifth the charnel rose four seas company boston i find the following there is a strangeness about the art of conrad aiken that makes it unique no one is writing just like him in america today this remark is not only true it is probably the one true thing that has ever been said about aiken and because of this strangeness which i think springs from the fact that both in his poetry and in his prose criticism aiken is a metaphysician he has been more variously estimated by writers and critics on both sides of the atlantic than any man i know he is profoundly disliked by many mistrusted by some and admired if at all by a few i turn to page thirty one of the poem he calls sanlin a biography really i like to think that the subject of this poem is aiken himself and call the following stanzas it is morning sanlin says and in the morning when the light drips through the shutters like the dew i arise i face the sunrise and do the things my fathers learned to do stars in the purple dusk above the rooftops pale in a saffron mist and seem to die and i myself on a swiftly tilting planet stand before a glass and tie my tie i stand before a mirror and comb my hair how small and white my face the green earth tilts through a sea of air and bathes in a flame of space it is morning sunland says and in the morning should i not pause in the light to remember god upright and firm i stand on a star unstable he is immense and lonely as a cloud i will dedicate this moment before my mirror to him alone for him i will comb my hair except these humble offerings cloud of silence i will think of you as i descend the stair 
here we have a kind of poetry profoundly unsettling of our cherished conventions and prejudices either we are by nature timid anthropomorphists in matters of religion despite all the evidence that can be urged to the contrary or we are simply indifferent but aiken is neither he looks beneath the surface of age-old compromises and sees the body of every man poised on an unstable helpless planet carefully arranging his tie while his soul darkened and without knowledge humbly seeks to penetrate to the cause of all things the cruel clarity of such perception as this startles and horrifies but none the less it is both beautiful and true in this mind we find all our minds mirrored poetry cannot do more even more profoundly disturbing more intoxicatingly demonic is the insight displayed in the poem which gives this volume its title the charnel rose the subject of this poem is sexual desire and out of desire the desire of the moth for the star the desire that has tormented every great mind from st augustine to nietzsche aiken has woven a vast symphony quotation here is useless we are simply upborne in these mad delirious waves of drunken music that flow in and out endlessly we are hurried from one chaos into another so that we should be in danger of losing our bearings utterly were not the mind and voice directing this orchestra that of a poet to shape this world of leaderless ghostly passions or else be mobbed by it that is the question in these lines is summed up the whole purpose of the poem conrad aiken has shaped this world for us has striven to make tangible to us the intangible substance of our lives and we cannot withhold from him a meed of praise as great as that of any poet living and writing in america today end of conrad aiken metaphysical poet by john gould fletcher from the dial may thirty one nineteen nineteen formulae for the great american short story by dorothy parker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. Formulae for the Great American Short Story by Dorothy Parker. The hero will not propose to the heroine because she is the daughter of James R. Patterson, known as Iron Jim, and consequently she is heiress to one of the greatest fortunes in America. He eventually does. Two, Mr. and Mrs. Billy Curtis members of the young married set of bleasdale are gradually drifting apart owing to bridge cocktails motoring fox-trotting and golf on the night of the country club dance billy jr is stricken with a fever mr and mrs curtis find reconciliation and the dawn of a new life at his crib side billy jr recovers three ralph cedric cub reporter stumbles upon the greatest news beat the morning planet has ever known he wins the grateful tears of the gruff old city editor and the hand of the daughter of the banker whose name he clears of suspicion four mrs irwin godfrey stifled by riches and misunderstood by a husband absorbed in business plans making a break from the riviera with norman keating the artist who is ten years her junior she does not go through with it five tommy deering halfback on his college eleven cleans up one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in advertising and the affections of his boss's daughter end of formula for the great american short story by dorothy parker A Great Flight of Robins and Cedar Birds by Nathan Clifford Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
org. Camden, South Carolina, was visited on February 3rd, 1905, by a storm of sleet and snow. At eight o'clock next morning, the town had a wintry aspect, and the thermometer indicated only 22 degrees. There was no sun, but the storm was at an end, and the northeast wind was light. When I first looked out of doors, robins and cedar birds were flying over in large numbers, going about west-northwest. It soon became evident that the flight was unusual, and at twenty minutes to nine o'clock I took up a position at a window from which I had an unobstructed view for long distances towards the east, north and west. Here, for an hour and a half, pencil and paper in hand, I endeavoured to count the passing birds. The robins flew in open order and were little more numerous at one time than another. The cedar birds, however, though many of them also went by in open order, were mostly gathered in masses containing from twenty to four hundred birds or more each. They swept along very rapidly. Their largest masses suggested scudding clouds and were decidedly impressive. The robins moved a good deal more slowly. Both species flew at altitudes varying from twenty to one hundred yards from the ground, and most of the birds passed within a distance of one hundred and fifty yards from my window, none, I think, farther away than about an eighth of a mile. At ten minutes past ten o'clock, I was obliged to take up some work which was awaiting me, but I frequently looked out of the window after that hour, and could detect no diminution in the number of passing birds until after one o'clock p.m. All the afternoon they flew by in gradually diminishing numbers, a good many robins tarrying for brief periods in the fields before my window. Throughout the day the direction of the flight was the same, and there was practically no retrograding. Altogether I saw less than a hundred birds coming back, all robins. I found that I had counted a total of 20,400 birds in the hour and a half, at least 14,000 of which were cedar birds. These figures are much inside the mark. Between 10 minutes past 10 a.m. and 1 o'clock p.m., twice the number of birds that I had previously counted must have gone by. A multitude had passed before I began counting. 10,000 at the lowest estimate possible, must have followed during the remainder of the afternoon. In the course of the day, therefore, many more than 60,000 birds passed over that part of Camden which I overlooked. I believe that 75,000, 50,000 cedar birds would be too low an estimate. The path of flight also extended south of my position at the window. I cannot say how far it extended, and I can offer no estimate of the number of birds which passed on that side. As usual, robins had this year become more common in and about the town with the approach of February, but there had been no indication of any massing for this flight. Cedar birds had been common throughout the previous months of the winter. I had never seen them in large numbers, however except on February 3rd, the day before the flight, when I found some 500 of them restlessly flying about a nearby swamp. They all came together here at times in a dense mass, only to break up again into comparatively small parties. The two species were numerous in the vicinity for weeks thereafter. Still, it was plain that the great majority of the host which I had seen had passed on. While at Camden during the winters of 1903 to 1904 and 1905 to 1906, I witnessed nothing resembling this flight. Nathan Clifford Brown, Portland, Maine End of A Great Flight of Robins and Cedar Birds by Nathan Clifford Brown Read by Melanie T.
cardinal nicholas of cusa by rudolf steiner from mystics of the renaissance and their relation to modern thought published in german in 1901 translated by bertland kitely in 1911 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org cardinal nicholas of cusa a gloriously shining star in the sky of the thought life of the middle ages is nicholas chrysippus of cusa at trevis 1401 to 1464 he stands upon the summit of the knowledge of his time in mathematics he accomplished remarkable work in natural science he may be described as the forerunner of copernicus for he took up the standpoint that the earth is a moving celestial body like others nicholas of cusa sets out to mount from the knowledge one acquires in the isolated sciences up to the inner living experiences there can be no doubt that the excellent logical technique which the scholastics have developed and for which nicholas himself was educated forms the most effective means of attaining to these inner experiences even though the scholastics themselves were held back from this road by their positive faith but one can only understand nicholas fully when one reflects that his calling as a priest which raised him to the dignity of cardinal prevented him from coming to a complete breach with the faith of the church which found an expression appropriate to the age in scholasticism we find him so far along the road that a single step further would necessarily have carried him out of the church we shall therefore understand the cardinal best if we complete the one step more which he did not take and then looking backwards throw a light upon what he aimed at the most significant thought in nicholas's mental life is that of learned ignorance by this he means a form of knowing which occupies a higher level as compared with ordinary knowledge in the lower sense knowledge is a grasping of an object by the mind or spirit the most important characteristic of knowing is that it gives us light about something outside of the spirit that therefore it directs its gaze upon something different from itself the spirit therefore is concerned in the knowing process with things thought of as outside itself now what the spirit develops in itself about things is the being of those things the things are spirit man sees the spirit so far only through the sensible encasement what lies outside the spirit is only this sensible encasement the being of the things enters into the spirit if then the spirit turns its attention to this being of the things which is of like nature with itself then it can no longer talk of knowing for it is not looking at anything outside of itself but is looking at something which is part of itself is indeed looking at itself it no longer knows it only looks upon itself it is no longer concerned with a knowing but with a not knowing no longer does man grasp something through the mind he beholds without conceiving his own life this highest stage of knowing is in comparison with the lower stages a not knowing but it is obvious that the essential being of things can only be reached through this stage of knowing thus nicholas of cusa in speaking of this learned not knowing is really speaking of nothing else but knowing come to a new birth as an inner experience he tells us himself how he came to this inner experience Quote, i made many efforts to unite the ideas of god and the world of christ and the church into a single root idea but nothing satisfied me until at last on my way back from greece by sea my mind's vision as if by an illumination from above soared up to that perception in which god appeared to me as the supreme unity of all contradictions End quote 
to a greater or less extent this illumination was due to influences derived from the study of his predecessors one recognizes in his way of looking at things a peculiar revival of the views which we meet with in the writings of a certain dionysius the above mentioned scotus erigena translated these works into latin and speaks of their author as the great and divine revealer the works in question are first mentioned in the first half of the sixth century they were ascribed to that Dionysius, the Areopagite, named in the Acts of the Apostles, who was converted to Christianity by St. Paul. When these writings were really composed may here be left an open question. Their contents worked powerfully upon Nicholas, as they had already worked upon Scotus, Aragina and as they must also have been in many ways stimulating for the ways of thinking of eckhart and his colleagues this learned not knowing is in a certain way performed in these writings here we can only indicate the essential trait in the way of conceiving things found in these works man primarily knows the things of the sense world he forms thoughts about its being and action the primal cause of all things must lie higher than these things themselves man therefore must not seek to grasp this primal cause by means of the same concepts and ideas as things if he therefore ascribes to the root being god attributes which he has learned to know in lower things such attributes can be at best auxiliary conceptions of his weak spirit which drags down the root being to itself in order to conceive it in truth therefore no attribute whatsoever which lower things possess can be predicated of god it must not even be said that god is for being too is a concept which man has formed from lower things but god is exalted above being and not being the god to whom we ascribe attributes is therefore not the true god we come to the true god when we think of an over god above and beyond any god with such attributes of this over god we can know nothing in the ordinary sense in order to attain to him knowledge must merge into not knowing one sees that at the root of such a view there lies the consciousness that man himself is able to develop a higher knowing which is no longer mere knowing in a purely natural manner on the basis of what his various sciences have yielded him the scholastic view declared knowledge to be impotent to such a development and at the point where knowledge is supposed to cease it called in to the help of knowledge a faith basing itself upon external revelation nicholas of cusa was thus upon the road to develop out of knowledge itself that which the scholastics had declared to be unattainable for knowledge thus we see that from nicholas of cusa's point of view there can be no question of there being only one kind of mode of knowing on the contrary for him knowing clearly divides itself into two first into such knowing as mediates our acquaintance with external objects and second into such as is itself the object of which one gains knowledge the first mode of knowing is dominant in the sciences which teaches us about the things and occurrences of the outer world the second is in us when we ourselves live in the knowledge we have acquired this second kind of knowing grows out of the first now however it is still one and the same world with which both these modes of knowing are concerned and it is one and the self-same man who is active in both hence the question must arise whence comes it that one and the self-same man develops two different kinds of knowledge of one and the same world already in connection with toller the direction could be indicated in which the answer of this question must be sought 
here in nicholas of cusa this answer can be still more definitely formulated in the first place man lives as a separated individual being amidst other separated beings in addition to the effects which the other beings produce on each other there arises in his case the lower knowledge through his senses he receives impressions from other beings and works up these impressions with his inner spiritual powers he then turns his spiritual gaze away from external things and beholds himself as well as his own activity in so doing self-knowledge arises in him but so long as he remains on this level of self-knowledge he does not in the true sense of the word behold himself he can still believe that some hidden being is active within him whose manifestations and effects are only that which appears to him to be his own activities but now the moment may come in which through an incontrovertible inner experience it becomes clear to the man that he experiences in what he perceives or feels within himself not the manifestation or effect of any hidden power or being but this very being itself in its most essential and intimate form then he can say to himself in a certain way i find all other things ready given and i myself standing apart from and outside of them add to them whatever the spirit has to tell about them but what i thus creatively add to the things in myself therein do i myself live that is myself my very own being but what is that which speaks there in the depths of my spirit it is the knowledge which i have acquired of the things of the world but in this knowledge there speaks no longer an effect a manifestation that which speaks expresses itself wholly holding back nothing of what it contains in this knowledge there speaks the world in all its immediacy but i have acquired this knowledge of things and of myself as one thing among other things from out of my own being i myself speak and the things too speak thus in truth i am giving utterance no longer only to my own being i am also giving utterance to the being of things themselves my ego is the form the organ in which the things express themselves about themselves i have gained the experience that in myself i experience my own essential being and this experience expands itself in me to the further one that in myself and through myself the all-being itself expresses itself or in other words knows itself i can now no longer feel myself as a thing among other things i can now only feel myself as a form in which the all-being lives out its own life it is thus only natural that one and the same man should have two modes of knowing judging by the facts of the senses he is a thing among other things and in so far as he is that he gains for himself a knowledge of these things but at any moment he can acquire the higher experience that he is really the form in which the all-being beholds itself then man transforms himself from a thing among other things into a form of the all-being and along with himself the knowledge of things transforms itself into the expression of the very being of things but as a matter of fact this transformation can only be accomplished through man that which is mediated in the higher knowledge does not exist as long as this higher knowledge itself is not present man becomes only a real being in the creation of this higher knowledge and only through man's higher knowledge can things also bring their being forth into real existence if therefore we demand that man shall add nothing to things through his inner knowledge but merely give expression to whatever already exists in the things outside of himself that would really amount to a complete abnegation of all higher knowledge 
from the fact that man in respect of his sensible life is merely one thing among others and that he only attains to the higher knowledge when he himself accomplishes with himself as a being of the senses the transformation into a higher being it follows that he can never replace the one kind of knowledge by the other his spiritual life consists on the contrary in a ceaseless oscillation between these two poles of knowledge between knowing and seeing if he shuts himself off from the scene he abandons the real nature of things if he seeks to shut himself off from sense perception he would shut out from himself the things whose nature he seeks to know it is these very same things which reveal themselves alike in the lower knowing and the higher seeing only in the one case they reveal themselves according to their outer appearance in the other according to their inner being thus it is not due to the things themselves that at a certain stage they appear only as external things but their doing so is due to the fact that man must first of all raise and transform himself to the level upon which the things cease to be external and outside in the light of these considerations some of the views which natural science has developed through the nineteenth century appear for the first time in the right light the supporters of these views tell us that we hear see and touch the objects of the physical world through our senses the eye for instance transmits to us a phenomenon of light a color thus we say that a body emits red light when with the help of the eye we experience a sensation red but the eye can give us this same sensation in other cases also if the eyeball is struck or pressed upon or if an electric spark is allowed to pass through the head the eye has a sensation of light it is thus evident that even in the cases in which we have the sensation of a body emitting red light something may really be happening in that body which has no sort of resemblance to the color we sensate whatever may be actually happening outside of us in space so long as what happens is capable of making an impression on the eye there arises in us the sensation of light thus what we experience arises in us because we possess organs constituted in a particular manner what happens outside in space remains outside of us we know only the effects which the external happenings call up in us hermann hermholtz eighteen twenty one to eighteen ninety three has given a clearly outlined expression to this thought Quote, our sensations are simply effects which are produced in our organs by external causes and the manner in which such an effect will show itself depends naturally enough altogether upon the kind of apparatus upon which the action takes place in so far as the quality of our sensation gives us information as to the particular nature of the external action which produces the sensation so far can the sensation be regarded as a sign or symbol of this external action but not as an image or reproduction of it for we expect in a picture some kind of resemblance to the object it represents thus in a statue resemblance of form in a drawing resemblance in the perspective projection of the field of view in a painting resemblance of color in addition a symbol however is not required to have any sort of resemblance to that which it symbolizes the necessary connection between the object and the symbol is limited to this that the same object coming into action under the same conditions shall call up the same symbol and that therefore different symbols shall always correspond to different objects when berries of a certain kind in ripening produce together red coloration and sugar then red color and a sweet taste will always find themselves together in our sensation of berries of this form End quote. let us follow out step by step the line of thought which this view makes its own 
it is assumed that something happens outside of me in space this produces an effect upon my sense organs and my nervous system conducts the impressions thus made to my brain there another occurrence is brought about i experience the sensation red now follows the assertion therefore the sensation red is not outside not external to me it is in me all our sensations are merely symbols or signs of external occurrences of whose real quality we know nothing we live and move in our sensations and know nothing of their origin in the spirit of this line of thought it would thus be possible to assert that if we had no eyes color would not exist for then there would be nothing to translate this to us wholly unknown external happening into the sensation red for many people this line of thought possesses a curious attraction but nevertheless it originates in a complete misconception of the facts under consideration were it not that many of the present-day scientists and philosophers are blinded even to absurdity by this line of thought one would need to say less about it but as a matter of fact this blindness has ruined in many respects the thinking of the present day in truth since man is but one object or thing among other things it naturally follows that if he is to have any experience of them at all they must make an impression upon him somehow or other something that happens outside the man must cause something to happen within him if in his visual field the sensation red is to make its appearance the whole question turns upon this what is without what within outside of him something happens in space and time but within there is undoubtedly a similar occurrence for in the eye there occurs such a process which manifests itself to the brain when i perceive the color red this process which goes on inside me i cannot perceive directly any more than i can directly perceive the wave motions outside which the physicist conceives of as answering to the color red but really it is only in this sense that i can speak of an inside and an outside at all only on the plane of sense perception can the opposition between outside and inside hold good the recognition of this leads me to assume the existence outside of a process in space and time although i do not directly perceive it at all and the same recognition further leads me to postulate a similar process within myself although i cannot directly perceive that either but as a matter of fact i habitually postulate analogous occurrences in space and time in ordinary life which i do not directly perceive as for instance when i hear piano playing next door and assume that a human being in space is seated at the piano and is playing upon it and my conception when i speak of processes happening outside of and within me is just the same i assume that these processes have qualities analogous to those of the processes which do fall within the province of my senses only that because of certain reasons they escape my direct perception if i were to attempt to deny to these processes all the qualities which my senses show me in the domains of space and time i should in reality and in truth be trying to think something not unlike the famous knife without a handle whose blade was wanting therefore i can only say that space and time processes take place outside me that bring about space and time processes within me and both are necessary if the sensation red is to appear in my field of vision and in so far as this red is not in space and time i shall seek for it equally in vain whether i seek without or within myself those scientists and philosophers who cannot find it outside ought not to want to find it inside either for it is not inside in exactly the same sense in which it is not outside 
to declare that the total content of that which the sense world presents to us is but an inner world of sensation or feeling and then to endeavor to tack on something external or outside of it is a wholly impossible conception hence we must not speak of red sweet hot etc as being symbols or signs which as such are only aroused within us and to which outside of us something totally different corresponds for that which is really set going within us as the effect of such external happening is something altogether other than what appears in the field of our sensations if we want to call that which is within us a symbol then we can say these symbols make their appearance within our organism in order to mediate to us the perceptions which as such in their immediacy are neither within nor outside of us but belong on the contrary to that common world of which my external world and my internal world are only parts in order to be able to grasp this common world i must it is true raise myself to that higher plane of knowledge for which an inner and an outer no longer exist i know quite well that people who pride themselves on the gospel that our entire world of experience builds itself up out of sensations and feelings of unknown origin will look contemptuously upon these remarks as for instance dr eric adikis in his book kant contra haeckel observes condescendingly quote, at first people like haeckel and thousands of his type philosophize gaily away without troubling themselves about theory of knowledge or critical self-reflection such gentlemen have no inkling of how cheap their own theories of knowledge are they suspect the lack of critical self-reflection only in others. Let us leave to them their wisdom. Nicholas of Cusa expresses some very telling thoughts bearing directly upon this very point. The clear and distinct way in which he holds apart the lower and the higher knowledge enables him on the one side to arrive at a full and complete recognition of the fact that man as a sense being can only have in himself processes which as effects must necessarily be altogether unlike the corresponding external processes while on the other side it guards him against confusing the inner processes with the facts which make their appearance in the field of our perceptions and which in their immediacy are neither outside nor inside but altogether transcend this opposition of in and out but nicholas was hampered in the thorough carrying through of these ideas by his priestly garments so we see how he makes a fine beginning with the process from knowing to not knowing at the same time we must also note that in the domain of the higher knowledge or ignorance he unfolds practically nothing but the content of the theological teaching which the scholastics also give us certainly he knows how to expound his theological content in a most able manner he presents us with teachings about providence christ the creation of the world man's salvation the moral life which are kept thoroughly in harmony with dogmatic christianity it would have been in accordance with his mental starting point to say i have confidence in human nature that after having plunged deeply into the science of things in all directions it is capable of transforming from within itself this knowing into a not knowing in such wise that the highest insight shall bring satisfaction in that case he would not simply have accepted the traditional ideas of the soul immortality salvation god creation the trinity and so forth as he actually did but he would have represented his own 
but nicholas personally was however so saturated with the conceptions of christianity that he might well believe himself to have awakened in himself a not knowing of his own while yet he was merely bringing to light the traditional views in which he was brought up but he stood upon the verge of a terrible precipice in the spiritual life of man he was a scientific man now science primarily estranges us from the innocent harmony in which we live with the world so long as we abandon ourselves to a purely naive attitude towards life in such an attitude to life we dimly feel our connection to the world whole we are beings like others forming links in the chain of nature's workings but with knowledge we separate ourselves off from the whole we create within us a mental world wherein we stand alone and isolated over against nature we have become enriched but our riches are a burden which we bear with difficulty for it weighs primarily upon ourselves alone and we must now by our own strength find the way back again to nature we have to recognize that we ourselves must now fit our wealth in the stream of world activities just as previously nature herself had fitted in our poverty all evil demons lie in wait for man at this point his strength can easily fail him instead of himself accomplishing this fitting in he will if his strength thus fails seek refuge in some revelation coming from without which frees him again from his loneliness which leads back once more to the knowledge that he feels a burden into the very womb of being into the godhead like nicholas of cusa he will believe that he is travelling his own road and yet in reality he will be only following the path which his own spiritual evolution has pointed out for him now there are in the main three roads which one can follow when once one has reached the point at which nicholas had arrived the one is positive faith forcing itself upon us from without the second is despair one stands alone with one's burden and feels the whole universe tottering with oneself the third road is the development of the deepest most inward powers of man confidence trust in the world must be one of our guides upon this third path courage to follow that confidence whithersoever it may lead us must be the other and of cardinal nicholas of cusa by rudolf steiner from mystics of the renaissance and their relation to modern thought published in german in nineteen o one translated by bertland kitely in nineteen eleven the non-existence of magic by roger bacon twelve hundred and fourteen to twelve hundred and ninety four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org roger bacon the greatest natural philosopher of the middle ages was born in somersetshire england about twelve hundred and fourteen educated at oxford and paris by a luckless impulse he joined the franciscan mendicant order for which he had no vocation and which conflicted violently with his real one his mind was singularly like that of his great namesake francis bacon he believed in observation and experiment as the basis of deduction and never ceased urging the study of original sources and texts as the basis of any sound theological knowledge this theory counsel and practice convinced his superiors that he was heretically minded and dangerous and they imprisoned him for some years about twelve sixty five pope clement the fourth hearing of his scientific attainments asked him to write out and send a summary of what he knew in an incredibly short time though denied pens and paper except by special permission p 
penniless and obliged to get materials and skilled help he wrote and sent his vast opus magus a summary of all known science and filled with original experiments and acute deductions he wrote also the opus minus opus tertium and minor pieces in twelve seventy eight his writings were condemned by his order as heretical and he was again confined he died in twelve ninety four his medieval repute as a magician was an ironical fate for one whose chief work was to combat such delusions to william of paris of and against fabricated appearances and of and against invocation of spirits i respond heartily to your request for though nature may be potent and wonderful yet art using nature as an instrument is more potent than natural gifts as we see in many things but whatever is beyond the operation of nature or of art either is not human or is fabricated and filled with frauds for there are those who fabricating appearances by swift motion of the organs or diversity of voices or ingenuity of apparatus or darkness or by collusion put many marvels before mortals which have no truths of existence the world is full of these as is manifest to the inquirer the jugglers play many tricks by quickness of hand and mediums fabricating a variety of voices in the stomach and throat and mouth form human voices far and near as they choose as if a spirit spoke through the man and they shape sounds as of brutes but pipes laid under the grass and hidden in recesses of the ground show us that the voice is human not of spirits which is fabricated with such huge mendacity and when inanimate things are moved swiftly in the dusk of morning or evening that is not reality but fraud and trick as to collusion it fabricates everything men wish according as they arrange with each other into all these however neither philosophic consideration investigates nor art nor the power of nature pauses to look but beside these is a more mischievous occupation when men against the laws of philosophy and against all reason invoke nefarious spirits through whom to achieve their will and their mistake is in this that they believe spirits to be subject to them and coerced by human power for this is impossible because human force is far inferior to that of spirits and on this point men err still more in this that they believe by the use of some natural means they can summon spirits or put them to flight and the error has been made up to this time when men strive by invocations and supplications and sacrifices to placate them and bring them into the service of the summoners while it would be much easier without such trial of skill to supplicate god or the good spirits for whatever man ought to repute useful since not even in useless matters do malign spirits appear favorable except so far as sinful deeds are permitted through men by god who rules and guides the human race and so these methods are beyond the example set by wisdom on the contrary they rather operate the other way nor do the truly philosophic ever concern themselves in the manner following of magic characters charms and their uses what should be held concerning charms and characters and other things of the kind i consider after this fashion it is far from doubtful that everything of the kind is at the present time false and uncertain for whatever things are universally beyond reasoning out which philosophers have come upon in the works of nature or art they have hidden as secrets from the unworthy thus if it were universally unknown that a magnet draws iron and someone wished to perform this feat in public he would draw characters and utter charms lest it might be perceived that the whole work of attraction was natural all such performances must be erroneous thus therefore so many things are hidden in the worlds of philosophers in many ways that a wise man ought to have the prudence to neglect charms and characters and investigate the works of nature and art 
and thus he should perceive that things as well animate as inanimate harmonize with each other according to the conformities of nature not according to the virtue of characters or a charm and thus many secrets of nature and art are estimated as magic by the unlearned and the magicians foolishly confide in characters and charms to which they ascribe virtue and by following them forsake the works of nature or art for the error of charms and characters and so this race of men is deprived of the utilities of wisdom impelled by its folly there are certain supplications of antiquity instituted by righteous men or still higher ordained by god and the angels and these can thus retain their primal virtue so in many regions to this day certain utterances are made over burning iron and over the waters of a stream and other like matters by which the innocent are absolved or the guilty condemned in the case and these are made by the authority of the church and of prelates for even the priests themselves make exorcisms with blessed water as is written in the old law of purgation by water by which the woman is proved an adulteress or faithful to her husband and there are many of the sort but the things contained in the magician's books are all forbidden by law however much truth they may contain because they are so much abused by rogues that it is not possible to distinguish between the true and the false hence whatever they say as to solomon or other wise men having composed this or that is to be denied because books of this sort are not received by the authority of the church nor by the wise but by misleaders who deceive the world furthermore they compose new books themselves and multiply new inventions as we know by experience and then that they may entice men the more forcibly they prefix famous titles to these books and imprudently ascribe them to great authors and that they may leave no contingency unprovided for they devise a high-sounding style and fabricate lies under the pretense of their text as to characters they are either words arranged in inscribed figures containing the sense of a manufactured utterance or they are made to represent the appearance of the stars at chosen times of characters therefore our first judgment must be according to what is said of the utterances of the second sort if they are not made at the chosen times we know they have no inner efficacy and so he who makes them as they are formed in the books regarding nothing except the figure alone which he represents according to his pattern is judged by the wise as having done nothing they who know how to perform their work under the constellations due at a given phase of the sky are able to arrange not merely characters but all works either of art or nature according to the virtue of the sky but because it is difficult to know the skies with surety so there is much terror in them to many and there are few who know how to classify anything usefully and truthfully and therefore the mob of mathematicians judging and operating by the great stars do not accomplish much or do anything useful the learned however and those having sufficient skill can do many useful things as much by judgment as by working at chosen periods it is to be taken into consideration that a skilled physician and whoever else has to arouse the spirit can usefully according to the physician constantine employ charms and characters even if feigned not because the characters and charms themselves accomplish anything but that the medicine may be received more trustingly and eagerly and the spirit of the patient stimulated and he may more abundantly confide and hope and enjoy because the stimulated spirit can renovate many things in the body it informs so that it may convalesce from infirmity to health out of enjoyment and confidence if therefore the physician for the magnifying of his work that the patients may be excited to hope and confidence of health does something of this kind not for fraud nor for his own advantage 
if we believe the physician constantine it is not to be reprobated for he in his epistle concerning articles suspended from the neck thus allows charms and characters for the neck and defends them in such cases for the mind has much power over the body through its strong emotions as avicenna teaches in the fourth book on the mind and the eighth on animals and all wise men agree and thus sports are made in presence of the sick and agreeable things are brought to them on the other hand many things are sometimes conceded to the appetite because the passions conquer and the desire of life over death on wonderful artificial instruments i will first tell of the wonderful works of art and nature that i may afterwards assign the causes and manner of them in which there is nothing magical that it may be seen that all magic power is inferior to these works and worthless and first for the quality and reason of art alone for instruments of navigation can be made without men as rowers so that the largest ships river and ocean may be borne on with the guidance of one man with greater speed than if full of men also carriages can be made so that without an animal they may be moved with incalculable speed as we may assume the sith chariots to have been with which battles were fought in ancient times also instruments for flying can be made so that a man may sit in the middle of the instrument revolving some contrivance by which wings artificially constructed may beat the air in the manner of a flying bird also an instrument small in size for the elevation and depression of weights almost infinitely than which nothing more useful could chance for by an instrument three fingers high and the same breath and a less volume a man can snatch himself and his friends from all danger of prison both to elevate and descend an instrument can also be easily made by which one man can forcibly draw a thousand to him despite their will and so of drawing other things instruments can also be made for walking in the seas or rivers down to the bottom without bodily peril for alexander the great used these that he might view the secrets of the ocean according to what ethicus the astronomer narrates these things were done in ancient times and are done in our own as is certain unless it may be the instrument for flying which i have not seen nor do i know any man who has seen but i know that the wise man who planned this device completed it and such things can be made almost infinitely as bridges across rivers without pillars or any other support and machines and unheard-of devices of experiments in artificial sight but more philosophical forms have been invented for thus transparent glasses may be fashioned so that one may appear many and one man an army and as many suns and moons as we please may be made to appear for thus nature sometimes forms vapours so that two suns and two moons and even three at once appear in the air as pliny relates in the second book of his natural history for which reason many and an infinite number may appear in the air because after a thing has exceeded its unity no number is limited for it as aristotle argues in the chapter de vaco and thus in every city and on the other hand in every army there can be terrors infinite so that either through the multiplication of stellar apparitions or of men collected against them they may almost despair especially if the following instances should be taken with the first for glasses can be so constructed that things placed very far off may appear very near and vice versa so that from an incredible distance we may read the minutest letters and number things however little and make the stars appear where we will and thus it is believed that julius caesar on the shore of the sea in gaul discovered through huge glasses the disposition and sights of the castles and towns of great britain 
bodies may also be so constructed that the greatest may appear the least and vice versa the high may appear low and lowest and vice versa the hidden things may appear in sight for thus socrates discovered that the dragon poisoning the city and district with his pestilential breath lived in coverts among the mountains thus also on the other hand everything in cities or armies could be discovered by their enemies bodies could also be so constructed that poisonous beings and influences and infections could be let off whenever men wished for thus it is said that aristotle taught alexander in which instance the poison of a basilisk erected on the wall of a city against his army was turned against the city itself glasses could also be so constructed that every man could see gold and silver and whatever a man wished and whoever should hasten to the place of the vision should find nothing it behooves us therefore not to use magic illusions when the power of philosophy teaches us to perform quite enough but there is a sublimer power of construction by which the rays may be drawn and collected through various shapes and reflections to any distance we wish so far that any object may be burned for burning glasses acting forward and backward attest this as certain authors teach in their books and the greatest of all constructions and of things constructed is that the skies may be depicted according to their longitudes and latitudes in corporeal figure as they are moved in their daily motion and these things are worth a kingdom to the wise man these then suffice for examples of constructions however infinite a number of others may be put forward meantime of concealing the secrets of nature and art having enumerated certain examples concerning the power of nature and art that from a few things we may comprehend many from its parts the whole and from particulars universals so far that we may see it is not necessary for us to aspire after magic when art and nature suffice i wish now to follow items through their class and their causes and to give their method in particular but i judge that the secrets of nature are not transmitted through the skins of goats and sheep that they may be understood by any one who chooses just as socrates and aristotle wish and aristotle himself says in his book of secrets that he should be the breaker of the heaven seals if he communicated the secrets of nature and art adding how many evils follow him who reveals secrets further on in his point a gellius says in the book of the attic nights on the feast of the wise that it is foolish to offer lettuces to an ass when a thistle is enough for him and in the book of stones it is written that he lessens the majesty of things who divulges mystic ones nor do secrets remain of which the crowd is partaker by a commendable division the populace may be divided in opposition to the wise for what is seen by all is true and likewise what is seen by the wise and most of all by the noted therefore what is seen by the many that is the populace as far as of this sort ought to be held false i speak of the populace which is distinguished as against the wise in this commendable division for in the common conceptions of the mind it agrees with the wise but in the special principles and conclusions of the arts and sciences it disagrees with the wise laboring about appearances in sophisms and worthless matters which the wise do not care for in special and secret things therefore the populace errs and thus it is divided against the wise but in the common conceptions of the mind it is restrained under universal law and agrees with the wise but the cause of this secrecy toward the populace on the part of the wise was because the populace derides the wise and pays no heed to the secrets of wisdom and does not know enough to use the worthiest things and if by chance anything grand falls under its notice 
it destroys it and abuses it to the multiplex harm of persons and the community and so it is insane that anything secret should be written down unless it be concealed from the populace and with difficulty understood by the most studious and the wise so has run all the multitude of the wise from the beginning and it has hidden in many ways the secrets of wisdom from the populace for some have hidden many things by characters and charms others by enigmatic and figurative words as aristotle in the book of secrets saying to alexander o oh, alexander i wish to show you the greatest secret of secrets and the divine power shall aid you to conceal the mystery and to execute the design take therefore the stone which is not a stone and it is in what man you will and what place you will and what time you will and it is called the philosopher's egg and the terminus of the egg and thus innumerable things are found in many books and various sciences obscured by such speeches so that they cannot in any way be understood without a teacher how to make the philosopher's egg or stone and gunpowder six hundred and thirty years of the arabs being finished namely eleven fifty two a d i respond to your petition in this manner let there be taken of the bones of ada and of lime the same weight and let there be six at the stone of tagus and five at the stone of union and let them be rubbed up at the same time with water of life whose property it is to dissolve all other things so that they may be dissolved in it and cooked together and let this rubbing and cooking be repeated until they are inserated that is that the parts may be united as in wax and the sign of inseration is that the medicine liquefies over intensely glowing iron then let it be placed in the same water in a hot and damp place or suspended in the stream of very hot water then let them be dissolved and hardened in the sun then you are to take saltpetre and pour quicksilver upon lead and again wash and cleanse the lead with it so that it may be very near to silver and then operate as before also let the whole weight be thirty but yet of salt peter luro vopovir con utriet of sulphur and thus you may make thunder and lightning if you know the method of construction you can see nevertheless whether i speak enigmatically or truthfully and some may have judged otherwise for it has been said to me that you ought to resolve everything into a primal material on which you have two deliverances from aristotle in his popularized and famous book on account of which i am silent and when you have possessed yourself of that then you will have pure elements simple and equal and you may do this by contrary means and various operations which i have before called the keys of art and aristotle says that equality of powers excludes action and passion and corruption and Averroes says this in reprobation of galen and that is rated simpler in medicine and purer which can be procured and this is worth more than fevers and affections of the mind and body farewell and whoever shall have opened these things will have the key which opens them and no one may shut it and when he shall have shut it no one may open it end of the non-existence of magic by roger bacon 1214 to 1294on lying awake at night by stuart edward white this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org on lying awake at night this is from the forest one of stuart edward white's many delightful volumes a very large public has enjoyed mr white's writings many of his readers perhaps 
without accurately realizing how extraordinarily good they are. Mr. White was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 1873. Studied at the University of Michigan, has hunted big game in Africa. Served as Major of Field Artillery, 1917 to 1918, and is a Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. His first book, The Westerners, was published in 1901. Since when they have followed regularly? Who hath lain alone to hear the wild goose cry? About once and so often, you are due to lie awake at night. Why this is so, I have never been able to discover. It apparently comes from no predisposing uneasiness of indigestion, no rashness in the matter of too much tea or tobacco, no excitation of unusual incident or stimulating conversation. In fact, you turn in with the expectation of rather a good night's rest. Almost at once the little noises of the forest grow larger, blend in the hollow bigness of the first drowse. Your thoughts drift idly back and forth between reality and dream, when snap! You are broad awake. Perhaps the reservoir of your vital forces is full to the overflow of a little waste. Or perhaps, more subtly, the great mother insists thus that you enter the temple of her larger mysteries. For unlike mere insomnia, lying awake at night in the woods is pleasant. The eager, nervous straining for sleep gives way to a delicious indifference. You do not care. Your mind is cradled in an exquisite poppy suspension of judgment and of thought. Impressions slip vaguely into your consciousness, and as vaguely out again. Sometimes they stand stark and naked for your inspection. Sometimes they lose themselves in the mist of half-sleep. Always they lay soft, velvet fingers on the drowsy imagination, so that, in their caressing, you fill the vaster spaces from which they have come. Peaceful brooding your faculties receive. Hearing, sight, smell. All are preternaturally keen to whatever of sound and sight and wood's perfume is abroad through the night. And yet at the same time, active appreciation dozes. So these things lie on its sweet and cloying like fallen rose leaves. In such circumstances, you will hear what the voyagers call the voices of the rapids. Many people never hear them at all. They speak very soft and low and distinct beneath the steady roar and dashing beneath even the lesser tinklings and gurglings, whose quality superimposes them over the louder sounds. They are like the tear forms swimming across a field of vision, which disappear so quickly when you concentrate your sight to look at them, and which reappear so magically when again your gaze turns vacant. In the stillness of your hazy half-consciousness they speak. When you bend your attention to listen, they are gone, and only the tumults and the tinklings remain. But in the moments of their audibility, they are very distinct, just as often an odor will wake all a vanished memory. So these voices, by the force of a large impressionism, suggest whole scenes. Far off are the cling, clang, cling of chimes, and the swell and fall murmur of a multitude en fête, so that suddenly you fill the gray old town, with its walls, the crowded marketplace, the decent peasant crowd, the booths the mellow church building with its bells, the warm, dust-moted sun. Or in the pauses between the swish-dash-dashings of the waters sound faint and clear voices singing intermittently, calls, distant notes of laughter, as though many canoes were working against the current. Only the flotilla never gets any nearer, nor are the voices louder. The voyagers call these mist people the huntsmen, and look frightened. To each is his vision, according to his experience. The nations of the earth whisper to their exiled sons through the voices of the rapids. Curiously enough, by all reports, they suggest always peaceful scenes. A harvest field, a street fair, a Sunday morning in a cathedral town, careless travelers, never the turmoils and struggles. Perhaps this is the great mother's compensation in a harsh mode of life. Nothing is more fantastically unreal to tell about, nothing more concretely real to experience, than this undernote of the quick water, and when you do lie awake at night, it is always making its unobtrusive appeal. Gradually, its hypnotic spell works. The distant chimes ring louder and nearer as you cross the borderland of sleep. And then outside the tent, some little woods noise snaps the thread. An owl hoots, a whippoorwill cries. A twig cracks beneath the cautious prowl of some night creature. At once, the yellow sunlit French meadows puff away. 
you are staring at the blurred image of the moon spraying through the texture of your tent the voices of the rapids have dropped into the background as have the dashing noises of the stream through the forest is a great silence but no stillness at all the whippoorwill swings down and up the short curve of his regular song over and over an owl says his rapid whoo 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 these with the ceaseless dash of the rapids are the web on which the night traces her more delicate embroideries of the unexpected distant crashes single and impressive stealthy footsteps near at hand the subdued scratching of claws a faint sniff 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 of inquiry the sun and clear tin horn co 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 o of the little owl the mournful long drawn out cry of the loon instinct with the spirit of loneliness the ethereal call note of the birds of passage high in the air a patter 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 among the dead leaves immediately stilled and then at the last from the thicket close at hand the beautiful silver purity of the white-throated sparrow the nightingale of the north trembling with ecstasy of beauty as though a shimmering moonbeam has turned to sound and all the while the blurred figure of the moon mounting to the ridge line of your tent these things combine subtly until at last the great silence of which they are a part overarches the night and draws you forth to contemplation no beverage is more grateful than the cup of spring water you drink at such a time no moment more refreshing than that in which you look about you at the darkened forest you have cast from you with the warm blanket the drowsiness of dreams a coolness physical and spiritual bathes you from head to foot all your senses are keyed to the last vibrations you hear the littler night prowlers you glimpse the greater a faint searching woods perfume of dampness greets your nostrils and somehow mysteriously in a manner not to be understood the forces of the world seem in suspense as though a touch might crystallize infinite possibilities into infinite power and motion but the touch lacks the forces hover on the edge of action unheeding the little noises in all humbleness and awe you are a dweller of the silent places at such a time you will meet with adventures one night we put fourteen inquisitive porcupines out of camp near mcgregor's bay i discovered in the large grass park of my campsite nine deer cropping the herbage like so many beautiful ghosts a friend tells me of a fawn that every night used to sleep outside his tent and within a foot of his head probably by way of protection against wolves its mother had in all likelihood been killed the instant my friend moved toward the tent opening the little creature would disappear and it was always gone by earliest daylight nocturnal bears in search of pork are not uncommon but even though your interests meet nothing but the bats and the wood shadows and the stars that few moments of the sleeping world forces in a physical experience to be gained in no other way you cannot know the night by sitting up she will sit up with you only by coming into her presence from the borders of sleep can you meet her face to face in her intimate mood the night wind from the river or from the open spaces of the wilds chills you after a time you begin to think of your blankets in a few moments you roll yourself in their soft wool instantly it is morning and strange to say you have not to pay by going through the day unrefreshed you may feel like turning in at eight instead of nine and you may fall asleep with unusual promptitude but your journey will begin clear-headedly proceed springily and end with much in reserve no languor no dull headache no exhaustion follows your experience for this once your two hours of sleep have been as effective as nine end of on lying awake by stuart edward whites read by april six zero nine zero california united states of america a short chapter on bustles by anonymous from the irish penny journal of eighteen forty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a short chapter on bustles bustles what are bustles i reader fair reader you may well ask that question but some of your sex at least know the meaning of the word and the use of the article it designates sufficiently well though thank heaven there are many thousands of my countrywomen who are as yet ignorant of both and indeed to whom such knowledge would be quite useless would that i were an equally innocent ignorance not reader that i am of the feminine gender 
and use the article in question, but my knowledge of its mysterious uses and the various materials of which it is composed has been the ruin of me. I will have inscribed on my tomb, here lies a man who was killed by a bustle. But before I detail the circumstances of my unhappy fate, it will perhaps be proper to give a description of the article itself, which has been the cause of my undoing. Well then, a bustle is, but the editor will perhaps object to this description as being too distinct and graphic. If so, then here goes for another less labored and more characteristically mysterious. A bustle is an article used by ladies to take from their form the character of the Venus of the Greeks and impart to it that of the Venus of the Hottentots. That ladies should have a taste so singular may appear incredible, but there is no accounting for tastes, and I know to my cost that the fact is indisputable. I made the discovery a few years since, and up to that time I had always borne the character of a sage, sedate, and promising young man, one likely to get on in the world by my exertions and therefore sure to be helped by my friends. I was even, I flatter myself, a favorite with the fair sex, too, and justly so, for I was their most ardent admirer, and there was one most lovely creature among them whom I had fondly hoped to have made my own, but alas, how vain and visionary are our hopes of human happiness. Such hopes with me have fled forever. As I said before, I am a ruined man, and all in consequence of ladies' bustles. In an unlucky hour I was in a ballroom, seated at a little distance from my fair one, my eyes watching her every air and look, my ears catching every sound of her sweet voice, when I heard her complain to a female friend, in tones of the softest whispering music, that she was oppressed with the heat of the place. My dear, her friend replied, it must be the effect of your bustle. What do you stuff it with? Hair, horse hair, was the reply. Hair, mercy on us, says her friend. It is no wonder you are oppressed. That is a hot and hot material, truly. Why, you should do as I do. You do not see me fainting, and the reason is that I stuff my bustle with hay, new hay. I heard no more, for the ladies, supposing from my eyes that I was a listener, changed the topic of conversation, though indeed it was not necessary, for at the time I had not the slightest notion of what they meant. Time, however, passed on most favorably to my wishes. Another month, and I should have called my Catherine my own. She was on a visit to my sister, and I had every opportunity to make myself agreeable. We sang together, we talked together, and we danced together. All this would have been very well, but unfortunately we also walked together. It was on the last time we ever did so that the circumstance occurred, which I have now to relate, and which gave the first death blow to my hopes of happiness. We were crossing Carlisle Bridge, her dear arm linked in mine, when we chanced to meet a female friend, and wishing to have a little chat with her without incommoding the passengers, we got to the edge of the flagway, near which at the time there was standing an old white horse, totally blind. He was a quiet-looking animal, and none of us could have supposed from his physiognomy that he had any savage propensity in his nature. But imagine my astonishment and horror when I suddenly heard my charmer give a scream that pierced me to the very heart, and when I perceived that the atrocious old blind brute, having slowly and slyly swayed his head around, caught the, how shall I describe it, caught my Catherine, really I can't say how, but he caught her, and before I could extricate her from his jaws, he made a reef in her garments such as a lady never suffered. Silk gown, petticoat, bustle, everything, in fact, gave way, and left an opening, a chasm, an exposure that may perhaps be imagined but cannot be described. As rapidly as I could, of course, I got my fair one into a jarvey and hurried home, the truth gradually opening in my mind as to the cause of the disaster. It was that the blind horse, hungry brute, had been attracted by the smell of my Catherine's bustle, made of hay, new hay. Catherine was never the same to me afterwards. She took the most invincible dislike to walk with me, or rather perhaps to be seen in the streets with me. But matters were not yet come to the worst, and I had indulged in hopes that she would yet be mine. I had taken, however, a deep aversion to bustles, and even determined to wage war upon them to the best of my ability. In this spirit, a few days after, I determined to wreak my vengeance on my sister's bustle, for I found by this time that she too was emulous of being a hot and top beauty. Accordingly, 
Having to accompany her and my intended wife to a ball, I stole into my sister's room in the course of the evening before she went into it to dress, and pouncing upon her hated bustle, which lay on her toilet table, I inflicted a cut on it with my penknife and retired. But what a mistake did I make! Alas, it was not my sister's bustle, but my Catherine's. However, we went to the ball, and for a time all went smoothly on. I took my Catherine as a partner in the dance, but imagine my horror when I perceived her gradually becoming thinner and thinner, losing her in bon point as she danced, and worse than that, that every movement which she described in the figure, the lady's chain, the chasse, was accurately marked, recorded, on the chalked floor with bran. Oh dear! Reader, pity me. Was ever man so unfortunate? This sealed my doom. She would never speak to me or even look at me afterwards. But this was not all. My character with the sex, I with both sexes, was also destroyed. I who had been heretofore, as I said, considered as an example of prudence and discretion for a young man, was now set down as a thoughtless, devil-may-care wag, never to do well. The men treated me coldly, and the women turned their backs upon me. And so thus, in reality, they made me what they had supposed I was. It was indeed no wonder, for I could never after see a lady with a bustle, but I felt an irresistible inclination to laughter. And this, too, even on occasions when I should have kept a grave countenance. If I met a couple of country or other friends in the street and inquired after their family, the cause, perhaps, of the mourning in which they were attired, while they were telling me of the death of some father, sister, or other relative, I, to their astonishment, would take to laughing, and if there was a horse near us, give the lady a drag away to another situation. And if then I were asked the meaning of this ill-timed mirth and this singular movement, what could I say? Why, sometimes I made the matter worse by replying, Dear madam, it is only to save your bustle from the horse. Stung at length by my misfortunes and the hopelessness of my situation, I became utterly reckless and only thought of carrying out my revenge on the bustles in every way in my power. And this, I must say, with some pride, I did for a while with good effect. I got a number of the hated articles manufactured for myself, but not, reader, to wear, as you shall hear. Oh, no, but whenever I received an invitation to a party, which indeed had latterly been seldom sent me, I took one of those articles in my pocket, and, watching a favorable opportunity when all were engaged in the mazy figure of the dance, let it secretly fall among them. The result may be imagined. I, reader, imagine it, for I cannot describe it with effect. First, the half-suppressed but simultaneous scream of all the ladies as it was held up for a claimant. Next, the equally simultaneous movement of the ladies' hands, all quickly disengaged from those of their partners, and not raised up in wonder, but carried down to their bustles. Never was movement in the dance executed with such precision and I should be immortalized as the inventor of an attitude so expressive of sentiment and of feeling. Alas, this is the only consolation now afforded me in my afflictions. I invented a new attitude, a new movement in the quadrille. Let others see that it not be forgotten. I am now a banished man from all refined society. No lady will appear where that odious Mr. Bustle, as they call me, might possibly be, and so no one will admit me inside their doors." I have nothing left me, therefore, but to live out my solitary life and vent my execration of bustles in the only place now left me, the columns of the Irish Penny Journal. End of A Short Chapter on Bustles by Anonymous Read by Colleen McMahon The Short-Leaved Sundew in Virginia by Gerrit S. Miller, Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. During the second week of May, 1903, I found the short-leaved sundew common in a low, moist field near the shore of Hampton Roads, about three miles west of Hampton, Virginia. The situation was open and rather less wet than those generally occupied by the more northern members of the genus, since the Drosera was closely associated with such plants as Custonia corulia and Pontentilia canadensis, rather than with the characteristic bog species. 
During the early hours of the day, the plant was conspicuous on account of its large whitish flowers, exceeding in size those of either of its companions. But by noon the corollas closed, and the slender scapes and small rosettes of reddish leaves were not easily detected among the grass. This record extends the northward range of Drosaria brevifolia from southern North Carolina and adds another to the list of lower austral plants known to reach the region of the lower Chesapeake Bay. End of the short-leaved sundew in Virginia by Gerrit S. Miller, Jr. Read for LibriVox.org by Melanie T. Sign Language Among School Children by Ernest Thompson Seton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Sign Language Among School Children by Ernest Thompson Seton. In taking observations among schoolboys and girls, I had this uniform experience, all denied any knowledge of the sign language, at first, but were themselves surprised on discovering how much of it they had in established use. One very shy little girl, so shy that she dared not speak, furnished a good illustration. Do you use the sign language in your school? I asked. She shook her head. Do you learn any language but English? She nodded. What is the use of learning any other than English? She raised her right shoulder in the faintest possible shrug and, at the same time, turned her right palm slightly up. Now, was my reply, don't you see you have answered all my three questions in signs which you said you did not use? Following the subject, I said, what does this mean? And I held out my right hand with the first and second fingers crossed. Pax, she whispered. And then, after further trials, I learned that at least thirty signs were in daily use in that local school. This was in England. In America, the sign Pax, or King's Cross, is called King's X. Fines, or fins, or fens bars up, or truce, meaning always, I claim, immunity. This is a very ancient sign, and seems to refer to the right of sanctuary. The name King's Cross, used occasionally in England, means probably the sanctuary in the King's Palace. In general, I found about 150 gesture signals in established use among American school children, namely, me, tap one's own chest. You, pointing to you. Yes, nod. No, shake head. Good, nod and clap hands. Bad, shake head and grimace. Go, pushing flat hand forward, palm forward. Come, drawing in flat hand, palm toward one. Hurry. The same repeated vigorously several times. Come for a moment. Beckon with forefinger, hand unmoved. Stop. Flat hand held up, palm forward. Gently. Flat hand held low, palm down, gently waved. Goodbye. Flat hand held high, palm down and forward. Fingers quickly waved up and down. Up point up. High, flat hand, palm down, held up at arm's length. Deep. Left flat hand, palm down, at level of mouth, right palm up, as low as possible. Heaven. Point up, very high, and look up. Down. Point down. Forward. Swing index forward and down in a curve backward, jerk thumb over shoulder. Across, 
hold hand out flat palm down run right index across it over or above hold out flat left palm down and above it hold ditto right under reverse of foregoing hush index finger on lips listen curved hand behind ear look flat hand over eyes look there point and look in same direction touch reach out and touch with index taste lay finger on tongue smell hold palm to nose friendship handshake warning index finger held up threatening fist held up weeping with index finger at each eye trace course of tears shame on you point one index at the person and draw the other along it several times in same direction you make me ashamed cover eyes and face with hands mockery stick tongue out at person disdain snap fingers toward person scorn throw an imaginary pinch of sand at person insolent defiance thumb to nose hand spread arrogant indicate swelled head pompous indicate big chest incredulity expose white of eye with finger as though proving no green there i am no fool tap one side of the nose joke rub side of nose with index connivance winking one eye puzzled scratch the head crazy tap forehead with index then describe a circle with it despair pulling the hair sleepy put a fist in each eye bellyache hands clasped across the belly sick a grimace and a limp dropping of the hands applause clap hands victory swing an imaginary flag overhead upon my honor draw a cross over heart or cross the hands over breast i am seeking looking about and pointing finger in same directions i am thinking lay index on brow lower head and look out under brows i have my doubts slowly swing head from side to side i will not listen hold flat hands on ears i will not look cover eyes with hands i forget slowly shake head and brush away something in air near the forehead i claim exemption or fins or bar up middle finger crossed on index i beg of you flat hand palm to palm pointing to the person i pray clasped hands held up i am afraid or surrender hold up both flat hands palm forward i wind him around my finger make the action with right thumb and index around left index i have him under my thumb press firmly down with top of right thumb you surprise me flat hand on open mouth i send you a kiss kiss the fingertips of right hand and throw it forward search me hold the coat flaps open one in each hand swim strike out with flat hands dive flat hands together moved in a curve forward and down will you come swimming two fingers in v shape held up level will you or is it so look nod and raise brows fool or ass a thumb in each ear flat hands up cut throat draw index across throat indifference a shoulder shrug ignorance a shrug and a head shake pay hold out closed hand palm up rubbing thumb and index tips together jew 
flat hands waved near shoulders palms up bribe hold hollow hand palm up behind one it is in my pocket slap pocket with flat hand give me my bill beckon then write on air match make the sign of striking a match on the thigh set it afire sign match and then thrust it forward pistol making barrel with left index stock and hammer with right hooked on snapping right index from thumb that tastes good smack the lips the food was good pat the stomach bad taste grimace and spitting out bad smell hold the nose bend with right hand bend left index break with fists touching make as though to bend a stick then swing the fists apart hot wet middle finger in mouth reach it forward and jerk it back cold fists near shoulder and shaken paint use flat right as a brush to paint flat left shave use finger or thumb on face as a razor wash revolve hands on each other as in washing knife with right fist as though holding knife whittle left index revolver hold out right fist with index extended and thumb up gun or shooting hold hands as in aiming a gun drive horses work the two fists side by side give me hold out flat hand palm up right make the action with index strike strike down with fist fighting make the fists menace each other drinking lift right hand to mouth as though it held a glass smoking make as though holding a pipe and drawing rub it out wet tips of right fingers and seem to rub thank you bow and at the same time swing flat right palm up a little way down and to one side church hands clasped fingers in but index fingers up and touching get up raise flat right palm up from low up high sit down drop flat right palm down from high down low here pointing down hand swung in small circle in all a hundred and ten besides the compass points the features of the face the parts of the body the numerals up to twenty or thirty and a great many half-established signs such as book telephone ring the bell etc which if allowed would bring the number up to nearly two hundred as another line of observation i have asked new york boys how many signs does the broadway policeman use in regulating the traffic any bright child remembers presently that the officer seldom speaks could scarcely be heard if he did indeed he relies chiefly on sign language and hourly uses the established signs for stop come on come here go right go left go back hurry up go easy i warn you i'll punish you pass keep behind me scorn and perhaps one or two others while not infrequently the small boy responds with the sign of insolent defiance that is used the world round and was probably invented by cain and abel similarly the car conductor uses the signs for do you want this car do you want transfer how many go on as well as most of the above evidently then the sign language is used of necessity in much of our life where speech is impossible end of sign language among school children by ernest thompson seaton some nonsense about a dog by harry estes downs this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Harry Estes Downs was born in Syracuse in 1889 and graduated from Hamilton College in 1910. His first job was a cub reporter on the journal that newspapermen affectionately called The Old Sun. The adjective is pronounced as though it were in italics. He was on the staff of the Syracuse Herald, 1912 to 1914, spent a year in New Orleans writing short stories, and returned in 1916 to the magazine staff of The Sun. He was editor of The Sun's book review section, 1919 to 1920. In 1920, he joined the staff of the New York Evening Post. My hand will miss the insinuated nose. Sir William Watson but the dog that was written of must have been a big dog. Nibby was just a comfortable lapful. Once he had duly turned around and curled up with his nose in his tail. This is for people who know about dogs, in particular little mongrels without pedigree or market value. Other people, no doubt, will find it disgustingly maudlin. I would have found it so before Nibby came. The day he came was a beautiful, bright, cool one in August. A touring car brought him. They put him down on our corner meaning to lose him but he crawled under the car and they had to prod him out and throw stones before they could drive on so that when i came home i found with his mistress-elect a sort of pot-bellied bundle of terry oakum caked with mud panting convulsively still from fright and showing the whites of uncommonly liquid brown eyes and a pink tongue there was tennis that evening and he went along i carried him over the railroad tracks he gave us no trouble about the balls but lay huddled under the bench where she sat, and shivered if a man came near him. That night he got chopped bones, and she got a sensible homily on the unwisdom of feeding strays, and he was left outdoors. He slept on the mat. The second morning we thought he had gone. The third he was back, wagging approval of us and intent to stay, which seemed to leave no choice but to take him in. We had fun over names. Jelly Waggles, suggested from next door, was undeniably descriptive rags fitted or toby or nig but they had a colored maid next door finally we called him nibs and soon his tail would answer to it cleaned up scrubbed the insoluble matted locks clipped from his coat his trampish collar replaced with a new one he was far from being unpresentable a vet once opined that for a mongrel he was a good dog that a black cocker mother had thrown her cap over scottish mills so to speak this analysis accounted for him perfectly. Always, depending on the moment's mood, he was either a terrier or a spaniel, the snap and scrap and perk of the one alternating with the gentle snuggling indolence of the other. As terrier, he would dig furiously up by the hour after a field mouse. As spaniel, he would read the breeze with the best nose among the dog folk of our neighborhood, or follow a trail quite well. I know there was retrieving blood. A year ago, May, he caught and brought me not doing the least injury, an oriole that probably had flown against a wire and was struggling disabled in the grass. Nimi was shabby, genteel black, sunburnt as to the mustache, grizzled as to the raggy fringe on his haunches. He had a white stock and shirt frill, and a white forepaw. Brown eyes full of heart were the best point. His body coat was rough, Scottish worsted. The little black pate was cotton soft like shoddy, and the big black ears were genuine spaniel silk. As a terrier, he held them up smartly and carried a plumy fish hook of a tail. As a spaniel, the ears drooped and the tail swung meekly as if in apology for never having been clipped. The other day when we had to say goodbye to him, each of us cut one silky tuft from an ear, very much as we had so often when he'd been among the burdocks in the field where the garden is. Birds were by no means Nibby's only failing. In flea time, it seemed hardly possible that a dog of his size could sustain his population. We finally found a true fleabane, but deserted one day. He was populous again the next. They don't relish every human. Me, they did. I used to storm at him for it, and he used, between spasms of scratching, to listen admiringly so and wag. We think he supposed his tormentors were winged insects, for he sought refuge in dark clothes closets, where a flying imp wouldn't logically come. He was willful, insisted on landing in laps when their makers wanted to read. He would make advances to visitors who were polite about him. He would get up on the living room table, why and how heaven knows, finding his opportunity when we were out of the house and taking care to be upstairs on a bed, white, grimable, coverlets preferred, 
by the time we had the front door open. I used to slip up to the porch and catch through a window the diving flourish of his sinful tail. One of his faults must have been a neurosis, really. He led a hard life before we took him in, as witnessed the game hind leg that made him sit up side-saddle fashion, and two such scars on his back as boiling hot grease might have made. And something especially cruel had been done to him when asleep, for if you bent over him napping or in his bed, he would half rouse and growl, and sometimes snap blindly. We dreaded exuberant visiting children. Two or three experiments I hate to remember now convinced me that it couldn't be whipped out of him, and once wide awake he was sure to be perplexedly apologetic. He was spoiled. That was our doing. We babied him abominably. He was, for two years, the only subject we had for such malpractice. He had more foolish names than Wog, the dog of Mrs. Stevenson's, and heard more little language than Stella ever did, reciprocating by kissing proffered ears in his doggy way. Once he had brightened up after his arrival, he showed himself ready to take on L whenever we gave an inch, and he was always taking them and never paying penalties. He had conscience enough to be sly. I remember the summer evening we stepped outside for just an instant and came back to find a curious groove across the butter on the dining table and an ever so innocent nibby in a chair in the next room. While we were at the table, he was generally around it, bulldozing for tidbits. I fear he had reason to know that this would work. One fortnight, when his missy was away, he slept on his old man's bed. We had dropped titles of dignity with him by then, and he rang the welkin hourly, answering faraway dog friends, and occasionally came north to lollop my face with tender solicitude, just like the fool nursery in the story, waking the patient up to ask if he was sleeping well. More recently, when a beruffled basket was waiting, he developed an alarming trick of stealing in there to try it, so I fitted that door with a hook, ensuring a crack impervious to dogs. And the other night, I had to take the hook, now useless, off. We couldn't stand hearing it jingle. He adopted the junior member on first sight and sniff of him. By the way, would look on beaming as proudly as if he'd hatched him. The last of his iniquities arose from a valor that lacked its better part, an absurd mixture of Falstaff and Bantam Rooster. At the critical point, he'd back out of a fuss with a big dog of his own size, but let a police dog in Airedale, a St. Bernard, or a big, ugly cur appear, and Nibby was all around him, blackguarding him unendurably. It was lucky that the big dogs in our neighborhood were patient, and he never would learn about automobiles, usually tried to tackle them head on, often stopped cars with merciful drivers. When the car wouldn't stop, luck would save him by a fraction of an inch. I couldn't spank that out of him either. We had really been expecting what finally happened for two years. That's about all. Too much, I'm afraid. A decent fate made it quick the other night, and clean and close at hand. In fact, on the same street corner, where once a car had left the small scapegrace for us, we will tell ourselves how glad we are it happened, as it did, instead of an agonal ending, such as many of his people come to. We tell ourselves we couldn't have had him forever in any event, that some day, for the junior members' sake, we shall get another dog. We keep telling ourselves these things and talking with animation on other topics. The muzzle, the leash, the drinking dish are hidden. The last muddy paw track swept up. The nose smudge is washed off the favorite front window pane. But the house is full of a little snoofing, wagging, loving ghost. I know how the boy Thoreau felt about a hereafter with dogs barred. I want to think that somewhere, sometime, I will be coming home again. And when that front door opens, Nibby will be on hand to keep her welcome. End of Some Nonsense About a Dog Read by April 6090, California, United States of America Tadpoles From the Handbook of Frogs and Toads of the United States and Canada By Anna Allen Wright and Albert Hazen Wright this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Relatively, the eggs of some of the smaller frogs, like the robber frogs or little chorus frogs, are largest, while the bullfrog may have some of the smallest eggs. The size of the adult then does not determine the size of the egg. 
the ribbed toad and robber frogs have unpigmented eggs the latter go through their whole development in the egg which is laid on land all the rest of the frogs have pigmented eggs in the north the egg-laying season may be very short while in the south some species may breed almost any month of the year the number of eggs a female may have to lay varies from six in the robber frogs or one hundred in the little chorus frog to twenty thousand in the bullfrog some lay single eggs on the bottom of the pond or stream they may be attached to vegetation or free submerged in the water or floating many lay floating films most forms in northern countries lay submerged eggs some like toads have the eggs in strings or tubes of jelly though one toad has them in bars of four or five eggs and another lays single eggs others like spadefoots may have them in bands later cylinders or even have the eggs on stalks of jelly one the ribbed toad has the eggs in a rosary string some like wood frogs and meadow frogs have globular or plinth like masses the egg proper or yolk is called the vitellus which usually has a rather tight-fitting membrane called the vitelline membrane the vitellus usually has the upper half or animal pole pigmented black brown etc while the lower half or vegetable pole is unpigmented white cream or yellowish these pigmented eggs are normal to most frogs which lay their eggs in water exposed to the sunlight but a few frogs in the united states lay their eggs on land and away from the sunlight such are unpigmented about the egg there may be one or two or more jelly envelopes which become evident a few minutes after the egg is laid in some masses of eggs the outer envelope loses its distinctness sometimes the eggs are in tubes of jelly as in the toads some like peepers lay each single egg separately while others lay several single eggs at one time some surface films represent the moving about of the female like tree toad or others like the bullfrog mass mean the frog remained in one position toads crawl about and string the file along spadefoots lay a band from the base of a plant to its end and then go to another plant most species which lay submerged masses have the whole complement in one mass the males usually precede the females to the water and croak vigorously during breeding time the male with its four arms seizes the female in almost all frogs the eggs are fertilized just at or slightly after the extrusion of the eggs at first no envelopes about the eggs are apparent and the egg mass may feel soft and sticky after a few minutes this substance absorbs water and each egg is then revealed with its vitaline membrane and one or more jelly envelopes the eggs hatch in three to twenty five days depending on temperature and other conditions at hatching the larva has a distinct neck with a prominent head and body the tail is very small or absent on the ventral side of the head is an invagination or depression which is to be the mouth behind this comes the ventral adhesive disc or discs which help the little creature to attach itself to the egg mass or to hang itself upon some plant in front of the mouth are two deep dark pits which later become the nostrils on either side of the head appear swellings which become the external gills the eyes do not yet appear as development goes on the external gills appear as branched organs 
two or three on a side. The eye shows as a ring beneath the skin, and the tail grows and presents a middle muscular portion where the muscle segments clearly show. This middle part supports a thin wafer-like tail fin, the parts of which are called respectively the lower and upper crests. The nasal pit shifts in position and becomes the nostril, and the vent opens. The mouth appears, and dependence on the yolk of the belly ceases. Soon the external gills begin to disappear. A lateral flap or fold of skin connects the head with the body, and the neck region disappears. Beneath this fold, internal gills develop. Usually on the left side, but on the middle line in the belly in ribbed frogs and narrow-mouthed toads, the flap does not close completely, but leaves an opening, the spiracle. The water passes into the mouth over the internal gills and out of this hole. On the mouth, a membranous fringed lip with upper and lower portions, labia, comes into being. At the portal are horny jaws or mandibles. On the upper and lower portions are ridges of horny teeth. The eyes are no longer covered pigmented rings, but are now at the surface. The intestine has become much elongated and coiled, and in some can be seen through the skin. The skin of the back and head comes to have a series of sense organs or lateral line dots. The buds of the hind limbs begin to appear. The forelimbs start to develop beneath the skin. When the hind limbs have reached considerable size, the left arm comes out through the spiracle, or the skin breaks down, and later the right arm breaks through the skin, or the skin weakens for its egress. Normally it is held that the left arm comes out first. Often the right arm appears first. The process of transformation is now on. The tail crests decrease in size, and the creature begins to live on its tail, that is, to absorb it. The gills vanish, and the lungs begin to serve as the sole respiratory organs if the skin be not considered. The tadpole appears more and more at the surface or near the shore. The eye assumes eyelids. The tadpole mouth fringe, with its horny jaws and horny teeth, is discarded, and a true frog mouth begins to appear. The long intestine becomes wonderfully shortened for a carnivorous diet, and the small frog, with a vestige of a tail, is ready to leave the water. This process is termed transformation or metamorphosis. End of Tadpoles from the Handbook of Frogs and Toads of the United States and Canada by Anna Allen Wright and Albert Hazen Wright. Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Trees at Leisure by Anna Botsford Comstock. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If we could know the part that trees have played in the aesthetic education of man, mayhap we should find that they began this great and silent schooling when the savage, weary from his chase in the hot sun, sought refuge in their refreshing shade. While resting there, his eyes raised to the overhanging branches, there may well have come to him an uplift in the vague consciousness of a realm of beauty as far above his ken as the branches and shifting leaves were above the reach of his hand ages may have passed before man gained sufficient mental stature to pay admiring tribute to the tree standing in all the glory of its full leafage shimmering in the sunlight making its myriad boughs to the restless winds but eons must have lapsed before the human eye grew keen enough and the human soul large enough 
to give sympathetic comprehension to the beauty of bare branches laced across changing skies, which is the tree lover's full heritage. The mortal who has never enjoyed a speaking acquaintance with some individual tree is to be pitied. For such an acquaintance, once established, naturally ripens into a friendliness that brings serene comfort to the human heart whatever the heart of the tree may or may not experience. To those who know them, the trees, like other friends, seem to have their periods of reaching out for sympathetic understanding. How often this outreaching is met with repulse will never be told, for tree friends never reproach us, but wait with calm patience for us to grow into comprehension. In winter, we are prone to regard our trees as cold, bare and dreary. We bid them wait until they are again clothed in verdure, before we may accord them comradeship. However, it is during this winter resting time that the tree stands revealed to the utmost, ready to give its most intimate confidences to those who love it. It is indeed a superficial acquaintance that depends upon the garb worn for half the year. And to those who know them, the trees display even more individuality in the winter than in the summer. The summer is the tree's period of reticence, when, behind its mysterious veil of green, it is so busy with its own life processes that it has no time for confidences and may only now and then fling us a friendly greeting. The recognition of trees in this season of winter is a matter of experience and may not be learned from a book. Often the differences that distinguish them are too subtle to be put into words. However, some species portray their individuality in such a graphic manner that a wayfarer, though a fool, need not err therein. Such is the elm that graces our meadows and fields, where it marks the sites of fences present and past. At no other time of the year is the American elm more beautiful than when it traces its flowing lines against snow and grey skies. Whether the tree be young, slender and svelte, or grown to full stature, whether it be vase or fountain-shaped, there is in its dark twig-fringed bowl a grace shown in upward expansion, which is continued in the uplift of spreading branches and finds perfect expression in the final twigs that droop, as if in loving memory of their summer burden of leaves, in token of which the oriole's nest is tenderly held in safe keeping. In sharp contrast to the benignant and inviting curves of the elm is the self-centred outline of the isolated sugar maple. Even this tree is more graceful in winter than in summer. It displays its many straight branches, lifted skyward and ending in finely divided but well-ordered sprays, while earlier it was merely an elongated green period that served to punctuate the summer landscape. Widely different in habit is the great maple of the woodland, whose noble bowl rises, a living pillar, to the arches that uphold the forest canopy. We do not need to look up to its high branches to know it, for shining grey colour and a certain majesty of mien proclaim at once its identity and its place as a peer in the forest realm. Who would believe that a granite grey column could hold a store of sweetness, which a few weeks later we may have for the asking. The maple, more than other trees, seems to need to have its close-fisted bushiness pruned away by jealous neighbours to make it great and fine and generous. To those who think that in winter a maple is simply a maple, we should like to point out in contrast to the tree just mentioned, the graceful, smooth, grey-barked red maple, that true to its name keeps a bit of winter landscape warm with its glow, 
each of its bud-laden twigs a ruddy dreamer of scarlet past and crimson future. But to return to the field, there are other tree tenants of the safe fence corners that are worth knowing. The low, broad fawn apple, with its more or less horizontal branches dividing and subdividing into a frenzy of twiglets, shows a fitting framework for the great bridal bouquet which will cover it next June. The straight-limbed bird cherry with its shining bark, perhaps in ragged transverse rolls, and those shrub cousins of the trees, the sumacs, like bronze candelabra, holding their dark pinnacles aloft, black sockets whence once blazed crimson flame. Many of the trees planted by man for man's enjoyment give as good returns in winter as in summer. The honey locust, rearing its slender height protectingly above the homestead, or above the memory of one, its great twisted branches making picturesque any scene, however homely, its maze of twigs still holding its large, spirally rolled pods, which will in due time skate away over icy snowdrifts and plant their seeds far from the parent tree. The black locust, less picturesque, seemingly conscious of its nakedness, retaining a scanty garment of little rustling pods until spring shall again bring it to its exquisitely wrought leaf mantle. The horse chestnut, painting itself in broad style against the pearly sky, its sparse, bud-tipped, clumsy twigs appearing like nobbled antennae put forth to test the safety of the neighbourhood. The tall, straight, cut-leaved birch with its central column of white and white branches ascending stark and stiff and then suddenly breaking into dark fountains of deliquescence. The Lombardy poplar, a spire of green against summer horizons, now a vague wraith through whose transparent form we can see the sky and landscape beyond, and, as picturesque as any, the old apple tree, its great angulary twisted branches bearing a forest of aspiring shoots. The stream borders give us trees of strong individuality. The willows, unwilling even in summer to be taken for other tree species, assert their peculiarities quite as vigorously in winter. The golden osier displays its magnificent trunk and giant limbs upholding a mass of terminal shoots that tinge with warm ochre the winter landscape. The black willow, having cast its sickle leaves to the autumn winds, lifts itself in twins or triplets, or even larger families of sister trees, that stand in close confab on borders of murmuring streams, while the little pussy willows gather in neighbourly groups close to living brooks, where in summer they shade the darting minnows and in winter cuddle contentedly under their snow blanket and listen to the contented gurgling of the ice-bound waters. The sycamore loses nothing of its effectiveness when it loses its foliage. The dull yellow of the trunk and the pale grey of the great undulating serpent-like branches blotched with white show as distinctly against the snow as they did against the summer green. The very smoothness of the few large limbs make us unprepared for the way they break up into madness of terminal branchlets to which still cling here and there a button ball not yet whipped of its fibrous string. How different the young trees, so slender and shapely, and over-fond of reflecting their graceful figures in the still pools of streams. It might seem that the stream guards wear a uniform of khaki, in evidence of which behold the slender bowl of the great toothed poplar and that of the quaking aspen, which has shaken off its agitation with its leaves and meets the winter winds with serene courage. And likewise clad is the cottonwood, that guardian of western rivers, on which, though it be ragged and unkempt, the traveller's eye lingers lovingly. 
Another water-loving tree, which revels in swamps, is the pepper ridge. Extravagant in horizontal branches and twigs when young, it stands gaunt and bare when old, its main trunk looking like a decrepit mast with a few dilapidated yarn arms hanging onto it. The tamaracks are its neighbours. In summer graceful lacy cones, they now flaunt their scant jaundiced spires against the blue sky, unconscious of the sad picture they make in their conifer rally unnatural nakedness. In the forest depths in winter, we trust more to the shape and colour of the bowl and to the texture of the bark than to the branches above for recognition of old acquaintances. The beech wears the crest of its nobility woven into the hues of its firm, smooth bark. Its lower branches retain all winter many of their leaves, russet now and sere, whispering lonesomely to the winds, and with its leaves it retains its burrs, empty now of nuts, and hanging in constellations, quenched and black against the blue of the zenith. Novices often confuse the trunk of the beech with that of the birch, for the very inadequate reason that both may be transversely striped with white. The beech's stripes are woven into the texture of the firm, fine-grained bark and are as unlike those of the tatterdemalion birch as could well be imagined. The white birch coquettes with us with her untidy silken ribbons from the forest depths in a manner which a self-respecting beech would scorn and she is not the only one of her kind that wears shining ribbons although we are less likely to notice the darker colours of the black and yellow birches in all the woodland there is no more beautiful bark to be found than that which pencils the trunk of the white ash in fine vertical lines and fades away into smoothness on the lower limbs. The ash branchlets, though of pleasing lines, are few and coarse. Those of the white ash give the effect of being warped into terminal curves. Contrast the bark of the white ash with the rugged virile bark of the hemlock, and then turn to the basswood straight bowl and note the fine elongated network which covers it and learn to greet each as a friend well known and well beloved the hornbeam or blue beech ever tries to tie into a knot its twisted slender branches often even the grain of the wood is hard twisted so that the close bark shows as a loose spiral one wonders if it is because of this vital writhing that the sap which slowly oozes from the tree in spring soon turns red as blood. Very different in appearance is her sister, the hop hornbeam, whose slender trunk is covered with narrow, flattened scales that flake off untidily. The oak cannot be spared from the winter landscape. It is only when the oak stands bared like a runner for a race that we realise wherein its supremacy lies. We have made it a synonym of staunchness and sturdiness, but not until we see naked the massive trunk and the strong limbs bent and gnarled for thrusting back the blasts can we understand why the oak is staunch. However, there are oaks and oaks, and each one fights time and tempest in its own peculiar armour and in its own brave way. The red, the scarlet and the black oaks show a certain ruggedness as of knotted sinews in their boles, and their dark grey bark, irregularly furrowed, changes into flat plains above and smooths out into a soft dark grey covering on the vigorous though twisted upper branches the bark of the white oak is pale grey, divided by shallow fissures into elongated scales, yet with all a dignified dress for a noble tree. To one who is fortunate enough to have a Quaker grandfather, 
the white oak will bring a vision of him arrayed in his first day garb however there are vast differences in the white oaks of america as we keenly realize if we compare the conservative white oak of the east with its erratic picturesque sister of the pacific coast picturesqueness gone mad as described by an artist trying to sketch it the hickories resemble the oaks except they are more refined and less virile their limbs are shorter and grace is gained as strength is lost each species asserts an unmistakable individuality the shag bark vaunts the superfluity of its raiment the pig nut lifts a narrow oblong head its lower branches gnarled and drooping less drooping are the lower branches of the mocha nut and much more rounded its outline while the bitter nut bowl divides into several large branches that spread and form a broad head those cousins of the hickories the black walnut and the butternut attract our attention by their sparse rather coarse terminal twigs the wide flattened ridges of its deeply furrowed bark distinguish the butternut and often suggest the long smooth slats that hold the chestnut bowl in tight embrace no winter scene is perfect without the evergreens although these until dead never display to our curious eyes the history of their struggles for life as written on their naked branches yet to them alone among trees has a voice been given the poet has often been more sensitive listener than seer in the natural world and from the earliest times he has resung his fellow man the mysterious song of the pine although our evergreens retain their working garb yet they are trees of fine leisure during the months of frost and ice and whether they lift their mighty heads singly above the forest level or group themselves in green black masses they make strong the composition of the winter picture nothing brings out perspective of the snow-covered hills like a clump of great hemlocks in the foreground and the tassels of the pine are never so beautiful as when tossed in defiance against the stormy winter sky brave tree folk are these conifers of ours whether their span of life extends over three centuries like our pines or twenty like the redwoods they give us a wide sense of the earth as an abiding place on some winter mornings even the most careless of mortals must pay admiring tribute to the trees for again are they clad this time in a glittering raiment of soft snow such a day is the apotheosis of winter and one must needs go into the still forest and worship the stillness is commensurate with the whiteness the trees themselves seem conscious of it and rebuff the iconoclast breathe with their slowly and silently moving branches how differently the same forest meets the wind a few days later when a storm is brewing then the stiff branches with their twig sprays tear the howling intruder into whistling shreds until there is an all-pervading roar that is unlike any other of nature's sounds it might well be compared to the surf breaking on a rocky shore if it were not that it seems overwhelming instead of restless conquering instead of unceasing sentient instead of unaware february is of the winter months the impressionist the colorist in december the forest masses on the hills were brown or gray now they are painted in warm purple and the same royal color is to be seen in the shadows of the snowy valleys through a veil of sapphire haze that brings sky and forest and white hills into restful unity this slowly increasing richness of colour of the late winter in our northern landscapes is not often appreciated long before the frost leaves the ground and the snow slinks away from the hillsides 
the impulse of the warming sun is caught in the bark and buds it is this warm tint of the forest in february that brings to the heart the first subtle prescience of spring even before the chickadee fills it and makes the still woods echo with his sweet prophesying phoebe song happy is he who keeps his picture gallery always with him his life is full of joy to each of us is given a sky which many times a day is painted anew for our delectation and it is never more perfect than when in winter it is a background against which the trees are etched whether the horizon be crimson with the sunrise or gold with the sunset whether it displays the blue of the turquoise uplifted into the colour of the rose on snowy mornings or glows with the amistine splendour of afternoons or the beryl tints of evening the bare branches strongly outlined against it in harmonious contrast complete the colour chord with infinitely varying hues the trees there illuminate and with exquisite and intricate writing the trees there sign the diplomas of those whom they have educated end of trees at leisure by anna botsford comstock read for librivox dot org by melanie t why not the stoopies by harcourt farmer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. Why Not the Stoopies by Harcourt Farmer from The Theatre Magazine, 1919. Core Productions Unintelligent Stage Direction Stereotyped Plots Maudlin Sentiment Gross Vulgarity and Dangerous Viciousness rapidly losing for the picture house its former great popularity shall we call them stoopies it's just as short and expressive a word as movies and it's a little more accurate for the stuff that we are being deluged with today, in the name of the moving picture has about reached the limit of crass stupidity time was remotely ago when the film gave a certain promise there were a few big pictures with corking ideas behind them and those of us who were in the habit of dropping into a picture house for purposes of plain amusement hoped for better things but the one or two well we'll say three brainy directors have become so enthusiastic about the improvement of the movie that in their busy enthusiasm they've apparently forgotten how to improve it there's the pathetic example of one of our most prominent producers a man whose earlier pictures reached a very high level indeed but whose last three releases have been unintelligent compounds of sentimentality and incredible nonsense here is a man who could have done much but he's gone under the heavy seas of sugary stupidity have done for him recently we have been shown the isle of conquest norma talmage's latest release great expectations had been formed from the preliminary announcements of this picture the novel from which it was taken ranked among the best sellers yet its film production proved a rank disappointment the subtle wooing on the desert island the masterful man's gradual moral and physical victory over the delicately reared woman all that so potent on the printed page went for naught on the screen again the cinema had failed and so it goes a canvas of the last fifty important releases in the last six months fails to show one intelligent picture instead of a steady development in the writing of scenarios we've got a market decline there are pictures being shown all over the united states today that simply cannot be looked at not because they're immoral they not clever enough for that but because they are so amazingly cheap and tawdry day after day night after night the grossest of sentimentality and the most vicious kind of silliness are being unreal 
obviousness and crudity and vulgarity are being exploited by the commercially astute to such an extent that thinking people have become mentally paralyzed by the sickly stream of slush naturally this sort of thing is going to work both ways for in a very little while unless the manufacturers improve their wares thinking people won't go to the movies any more they'll be ashamed to be seen there the only kind of audience left will be those who have so lost the faculty of comprehension that they will sit watching the screen with the vacant stare of the idiotic the maudlin picture possesses a dangerous influence you can't see stupid stuff day in and day out without being affected by it people are rather particular about what their children read yet have no hesitation in letting them go to the movies worse they encourage them to go still worse they go with them and what do they benefit by it the doubtful ethics conveyed by the movie the offensive and insulting obviousness the deplorable unseriousness how can these things be of value to any of us it wouldn't be putting it too strongly to say that the movie has passed being just a nuisance it has become a menace the national backbone is unstiffened as each silly picture is shown there have been a thousand opportunities within the past five years to write and produce really sterling interesting inspiring material but no one has done it instead the public has been surfeited with the same old stories the same old chocolated situations the same old tedious ideas there has been a casual deviation now and then when some producer carefully underestimating our imbecility has made his picture a little more tedious than is the custom but this one puts down to zeal it's no good blaming the gentlemen who construct the scenarios they must live and it's rather futile to criticize too closely the individual producers they too like butter occasionally so is it a waste of valuable energy to attack the film editors they have their instructions these fellows are but wheels in the great industry they are simply paid workers but the men behind the big picture combines the men who have the say as to what shall be pushed on the public and what shall not these are the men who are making fat fortunes out of the movie menace the movie has brought about a curious condition of things men who were formerly stage managers in obscure stock companies blossom out as great directors the ideas of some of them about stage direction would make a real stage director howl third-rate actors and actresses formerly confined to the hinterland by reason of their incompetency are now national stars in receipt of undeserved salaries the size of which would make a bank president gasp and writers who were wont to tickle the magazines with sporadic masterpieces now command stacks of dollars as scenario experts it's a joke there are many talented earnest men and women engaged in the film business but you'll find in the majority of cases that it is mediocrity who is invariably pushed to the front starred boomed puffed still more important a consideration is this that the movie has brought into being a special kind of audience that this audience is largely composed of the illiterate and the unmental speaks volumes for the improvement of the movie they have learned by the studied administration of the movie magnets not to expect the best but to accustom themselves to the worst they have become inured to being fed on slush they have been trained to pay liberally for great chunks of sob stuff and drivel they are strenuously induced to believe that it is the public demand for pish-posh that brings stupid pictures into being and of course this state of intellectual coma is commercially encouraged we are told that there is a national demand for screened sentimentality obviously there is but is any person with common sense going to believe that the demand isn't skillfully engineered just as long as people continue to take whatever the movie people give them so much longer will be the reign of the silly stuff do you mean to tell me that the kind of mush that is served just now in our movie theatres is the best the film people can produce god has given them brains 
is this all they can do the moving picture has taken a definite and permanent place in our life in the right hands it can be a most potent and powerful instrument of amusement in the wrong hands it resolves itself into a sword in baby hands you can't tell what harm it's going to do it is not too exacting a demand to make of the picture people that they give the public the very best possible value for its money if the thinking section of the public doesn't get the right sort of picture very soon it will take the line of least resistance it seems to me that the picture people have a very big opportunity right now to produce the best that is in them if they don't they will be the losers in the long run End of Why Not the Stoopies by Harcourt Farmer